Evening, everyone. I think, Luke, you see we've actually got a record happening right now for the number of people um, already on the show before we even push the go button. So uh, welcome, everyone. And we have a, a very esteemed guest to thank for that, Mr. Todd Puck. Uh, next, and yeah, surprisingly, for having me, tonight. Um, Luke, he's got the best lighting happening tonight by the looks of it. I'm going for the side lighting. Uh, so Tom's going for that sort of um, high key sort of look tonight. Uh, Nick's going for the, the chin cam. Uh, this evening especially but he, he has an exceptionally good mood and smile to come along with it so uh wel welcome back what's uh what's been happening in um in the world the last couple of weeks gentlemen uh well i've um updated my laptop uh, so i've got luke's old laptop which um is actually a pretty damn good laptop for me and uh i'm down at the shack and so i've got chin cam going because it's uh, got its webcam at the bottom of the screen and it's a bit of a disaster from that <laughs> point of view so i'm looking at it now but it, you know as soon as i look at paul's beautiful face you know i've got the the chin thing going so excuse oh, my not, poor lighting and i mean the laptop can't do anything about your face i'm sorry about that but um oh, it can it's be. not my best angle to be honest <laughs> but anyway <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, 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 haven't, I haven't shaved in a while i didn't even notice till i looked into the screen here it's like it's been, been that kind of week for me uh, you've been up to my much call? Well, I had um, I had an interesting adventure with Lukey last week. We had um, we had snow down to three hundred meters in my backyard, like literally uh, on Kanani, just 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 around the corner. And I'm, I'm probably at about two hundred and eighty sort of meters, so just up the road, really. And it was it was one of those ones that actually lasted. And uh, so Lukey and I took um, Lukey's always been proactive. He's always way ahead of the game, and he drags me along for the ride on a few things. But he got me out of bed uh, pre dawn, which is saying something. <laughs> and uh, and we blasted up the mountain to the organ pipes um, just before dawn. And we had this magnificent sort of morning, um, traipsing around in the snow and having a good look at the pipes. And and we got a little bit of extra special permission to. Are we allowed to talk about it, Lucky? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, Lucky got a permit for us to fly over the pipes. Um, and uh, so we literally walked out. They didn't see a single soul and flew the whole time. We still did a single soul. And we just did a, a very, very, we had a very narrow kind of window where we'd organized to fly just under and around the pipes. And, um, you know, Licky being Licky's organ thinking, pipes, that is. <laughs> yeah, the organ pipes, that is. Um, he's always thinking about how, to, how do we, you know, what opportunities there are out there to get unique photographs that haven't been taken before. And I've been here 22 years and Nick's seen a lot of it. He, he might have seen more than us, Lukey and I, in terms of what's been done. But I haven't seen too many close up sort of, you know, panoramic videos of, of, of the organ pipes in snow. And if that can maybe get used for a campaign to stop the cable car or something in the future, that's, um, that's fine by my books. Well, that wasn't and, really um, my intention. Um, it was more just for, um, just a bit of fun, but, um, however they choose to get used is, um, is, um, you yeah, know, all right by me. Um, yeah. if the cable yeah, car I, company want to buy it, it's $200,000, but, um, that's probably small money for what they have. Um, it was, yeah, it was really beautiful, wasn't it? Like it was really. Um, I've never seen it from that angle and and that perspective and and with those conditions. It, yeah, really no, it was a magic, that. magic little um, adventure, and um, it was about ten k walk with a bung knee for you, so that wasn't too bad and over icy paths. So good old Tommy. By that, um, I've actually um, been on a couple of adventures myself lately, and um, spent some time on Freycinet, um, doing the Freycinet circuit in two days, um, and camped on Wineglass Bay beach and, um, did quite a little bit of walking around and, um, some different, um, angles that I've always wanted to photograph. And then, um, I've also just recently gone to Mariah Island and, and walked, um, what was it about 50 Ks over two days, um, which was quite good. Uh, and, um, also explored some lesser seen parts of the island and got some very cute photos of some baby wombats poking their head out of their mum's pouch, which is also oh. quite, quite nice. Um, and then I um, found out today I've done it all with pneumonia. So that's been quite good. Um, <laughs> what? So, um, yeah. So anyway, so a hundred Ks over. So you're going to have to go quite a show to drop this, mate. Probably why, why it still hasn't gone away, but thankfully the antibiotics should help a little bit with that. Yes. <laughs> oh, actually, I, I just realised a, a small connection with Nick. Nick, I um, I photographed this incredible um, vigil on on Monday night. So, some of you guys might be aware of a project I've done called Men with Heart. About um, it's pretty much about men's health and well being. And some of the men involved with that uh, did a twenty four seven vigil where um, they actually organised to stay on Parliament lawns for twenty four hours and and camp there and and actually have a, a campfire and invite anybody around to come. And explore and and um, about suicide prevention essentially, 
and it was open to the public and we had a beautiful kind of ceremony where anyone who lost someone could light a candle and we could honor them in some way and we had lifeline there and lots of different providers and and it was very very meaningful sort of body of work and i mean what well, is a body of work now that i photographed it it's going to be used for a few campaigns but um I mean, if you didn't know, it's quite a quick segue. We'll get back to the show in a second. But um, 24-7 stands for that every 24 hours, seven men a day take their lives in Australia. And that's not a statistic that many people are aware of, but it's a very, very potent one. So, yeah, so a bit of a thoughtful week in that regard. It's very um, poignant too, because I think also this week they had the record number of people calling Lifeline mm. uh, from what I can remember oh, hearing. Really? So um, certainly a lot of people doing it very, very tough at the moment. So certainly have thoughts with them and um, yeah, great work on on covering that event. Mm. Yeah, we had um, we had some police officers come and, and check it out. And and as, as soon as I mentioned, you know, any other photographers, oh, I know this guy, Nick Monk. Mike, oh, yeah, I know Nick. I work with Nick. He's awesome. So it was a bit like, uh-huh. uh, it was a bit of a crossover sort of night where um, I felt like you were, you were almost there, Nick. So um, you sure they said I was awesome? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 they did actually. Yep. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's so, cool. Uh, really it sounds like a, a beautiful event. I didn't know it was on. I, I probably would have come along if I'd been yeah it was it was really special actually um we were lucky that it was pouring down with rain and and just as we went down it it just basically stopped it it did get down to three degrees so the boys who were camping there for the night were (laughs) were racing around for a a late night hot chocolate so I could get through the night Mm. but they stayed there all night and all the lifeline crew came back in the morning and they're there on Parliament Lawns all day and um yeah I'm not shy about that um getting that information out there and and celebrating you know the, the good work's been done in that regard and um yeah, yeah, that was that made this week particularly special. I think Certainly looking at Jane's um, rainbow, those. rainbow, um, rainbow thing that she's sitting on, when well, that's that's probably that's supporting another cause again. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly agree. Hey, um, supporting those causes, and um, I'm also helping out with the Are You OK Day um, as well, which is um, actually on my birthday this year. Um, next, next, um, I'll um, I'll week, so, um, I so yeah, so I'm certainly happy to help out with those sort of causes, which is very close to my heart. So, um, yes, and um, we should probably introduce our, our absolutely fabulous guest that we have tonight, fabulous. Mr. Thomas Putt, and he's no stranger to the show. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tom, for joining us again, and it's always an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you. I think it's been about 12 months. I think the last time I was on, I was sitting in my car down at Wilson's Promontory in the driving, oh, freezing that's cold. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, we had Scotty and we had Mika on. We were doing a, a, a talk on shooting arrows, weren't we? Yeah, pretty that sure. Was the case. Yep. I feel like you've been on since then, Tom, but yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, here, there, and everywhere. They call me. We, you're probably <laughs> our, 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 uh, our, our most esteemed guest on the show, I reckon. I would have to agree. Yeah. And what I love about Tom is he, he's always up for anything. So, you know, I've, we've put out, I think I put out 15 invites in the last two weeks and I maybe got sort of one tentative reply and, and and it was tom and tom was the only one who's like yep next week what are we doing yep no worries and it's just like oh so so refreshing tom. Oh, so so i was 51st on the list jesus we're gonna get tom putt on again yeah. that's oh. it no to be fair we um we we sort of it's the first time we've actually put out a big reach to the internationals and a lot of them don't reply for two or three weeks or or you know they might be available for six months and so I'm actually talking about a lot of people, that, people that I don't actually even know that very well, Tom. So, so yeah. um, I've been wanting to do something on Karajini for a while. I think Karajini is, is one of the great iconic landscape locations of the entire of Australia. And I'm actually really surprised we haven't, we haven't gone over it yet. And when I, mm-hmm. when I thought about that topic, I, I straight away thought of you, Tom, um, you know, the first time I went was with, uh, with Tom, I think, um, well, no, close to that time. That. And we, We've done that we went, stuff before that, remember? And What's then that? You'd done that hiking stuff beforehand. Oh, it was you? before, was it? Oh. Yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah. yeah, that was before that. And then I got you along because you knew a bit about the park as well. Oh, uh, that's right. And I hadn't been before. So, yeah, that was... Oh, the- I didn't realise you hadn't been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did um, three weeks out there, actually. Right. And uh, I and I made it sort of a bigger trip, sort of heading around into... I think I went to Shark Bay afterwards and a few other places um, to make a big sort of loop out of it. One of those yeah. days when... Um, I do the old runway ticket, see what happens, tricks. And I actually looked up my friend, Glenn Turvey, who I, I did that trip with Tom and um, spent about an hour with him tonight, just reliving some of the memories of it and, and getting out some of the maps. And because it was, it was more than a decade ago now. So I was just like, was starting to stretch the, 
stretch our memory banks a bit. But what I loved about about Tom and I is, and the way he approaches a lot of his workshops is he's he's very well prepared and very thorough, very professional. We literally spent three days just scouting and going in all the different gorges and and mapping out the lighting and almost to the hour about where the places were to be wind and the way the different reflections on the different sort of um, uh, gorge walls sort of operate and light up different areas and different times of the day. It's actually quite specific and and you'll get a sense later tonight sort of how how having that knowledge, that built knowledge and that experiential knowledge is, there's, there's nothing to beat it. But I'm going back. If, if you hadn't met Tom Putt, you can tell how to spell his name by, by, all, the, by all the paraphernalia behind his head. But we're looking at his magnificent <laughs> gallery in, in Mornington. Tom's one of the most prolific landscape photographers in, in, in modern Australia. And to me, one of the key figures in it and easily one of the most supportive and approachable and prolific of, of all of us combined. And so we all sort of look up to Tom and what he's done with his career and, and the Probably one of the and, most attractive too, I'd have to say. Yeah. And you know, I've, I'm still trying to get his hairdresser's name and, and he wouldn't give me the name of his hair product tonight, but I was, um, <laughs> I, I did try. <laughs> But Tom's, uh, I don't know if he's got a carriage any book coming, but uh, I think we, we might oh. hear about hear about some other books tonight. I think we're beyond 14 now, so we must be moving into the no, 15 no, and 16 still, realm. No, no, I'm still on 14. It, uh, it's uh, the latest one. Not hasn't taken the life out of it, so to speak. It's more just um, I've been distracted by other things and family and and uh, lockdowns and all the rest of it. There, oh, there's a bunch of books I'd still love to do, but uh, it also involves money, and uh, and money isn't easy to come by when your gallery's not open and you're not running workshops. So mm-hmm. we're uh, yeah. we're just trying to keep uh, our head above water at the moment. But yeah, it'd be nice to know. And and besides, you know, other than being hit by a bus, I'd like to think that you know I've still got 20, 30 years in which to get get all those books done, so to speak. So you know, I'd like to ideally like to get them all done sooner rather than later, but. Yeah, it you, helps when you it helps when you're 35, isn't it, Tom? I'm sorry. It helps when you're 35, isn't it? <laughs> 35, 47 now. I'm, oh, I'm so am I. <laughs> 47. Just kidding to that one, Tom. <laughs> vintage, vintage year, mate. Vintage, very much vintage. I feel I I am slowing up there. Jesus, I tell you what, some of the stuff I was only thinking about Caragini tonight, and it's probably one of the hardest workshops we run. And it's probably one of my least favourable. And it's not because of the landscapes. The landscapes are epic. And if you haven't been, you'll recognise a lot of the landscapes that Paul and I show you tonight. But it's not until you actually go there and see it for yourself that you actually can really appreciate it and, and get to understand what all the fuss is about. And and yet it's it's logistically very difficult for us to run because of two reasons. One, as Paul alluded to earlier, the timing has to be critical. And you said down to almost the hour. Well, I take it down to almost a minute because there's places that we need to get to. If we don't get there on that, at that time, on that day, well, we just miss that shot. And and that's happened in the past, unfortunately, trial and error and things happen. So, you know, is that a a major concern? Probably not, but it's like, I like to tick all the boxes. and, And so therefore um, we do have specific times, specific places to get to. And then also to the logistics of getting into the gorges. I mean, it's not for the faint hearted. And even now I realize that the difficulties that some of my older participants must have because of, you know, mobility issues. And I'm not talking about anything major because we really can't afford to have anybody on who has major mobility issues because there's walking down into the gorges and they're quite steep and then there's slippery rocks and then there's, you know, walking on uneven surfaces, things like that. So it is um, a bit of a nightmare for a, a workshop leader like me because you think to yourself, oh, God, if something happens, Jan Burt, smiling away there. Um, <laughs> does everyone know Does everyone know the story about Jan and I? Uh, um, Jan saves up all this money and wants to come on our workshops, which is fabulous, and we have her along to the Kimberley, and on literally on day one or day two, um, she steps in this hole that's covered in spin effects, breaks her kneecap, which involves me having to carry her out um, from this location to the car, then take her back to camp. Then the following day when um, the pain hadn't subsided any further, take her into town. And um, that's where Jan spent the next seven days in hospital while we carried on and did our workshop. Unfortunately, um, she she missed out. But um, yeah, it's we can laugh about it now, can't we, Jan? 
Yes, oh. yeah, yeah. But there was like 12, 18 months of rehab for her physio and all the rest of it. It was it was oh, a horrible yeah. injury. But, um, for those on YouTube, them. just to, in, in case you didn't pick it up, Jen's on the Zoom call. So we're she is on the Zoom, yes. But, uh, there, so. You know, those sorts of things I just really do worry about because, um, A, I don't want people to get hurt, but B, also, too, that's Karajini is not one of the places where you want to get injured, as as you know, Paul, and those others yeah. who have been there. Um, it happens every year. And uh, and it's it's just one one mistake, and it can be it can literally be fatal, which is a horrible situation for anyone to be in. But uh, you know, we always take many precautions, and I like to scare the life out of people before we go do anything, just so they realise that uh, it's it's um, it's it's going to be things to consider. Yeah. I've got a couple Lots of questions of already. Um, Tom, firstly, um, do you try and go there every year, or or and you know how many times have you been able to make it there, and you know, is there sections where you actually need professional assistance to get around? So, yeah, that's two great questions. Um, I've been almost every year since Paul and I went in 2014. I did give it a couple of years rest just to be able to do other things because we like to go at the start of the season, which is uh, the beginning of April. And the reason we like to go at that time of year, around April, May, is because um, there's a lot of water in the gorges, although the, most of the gorges um, or, or some of the gorges are spring fed. So at the end of the day, there's always water running through them. But secondly, um, if you're gonna go into the gorges and wade through water or even do a little bit of swimming through the water, if you leave it any later than May, if you're into June, July, August, the water is freezing cold. Now you might be thinking, hold on a sec, you're in the middle of you know, WA, you're in the Pilbara, et cetera, it gets particularly cold at night. Um, that, that is gorgeous, don't get any sunlight any time of year, regardless of whether it's summer or winter. And so the guys who are running canyoning tours through there in you know, July, August are wearing full-on drive suits just wow. to be able to spend all that time each day in the water. You get hypothermia so otherwise, otherwise, I guess, that. isn't it? What's that? You get hypothermia otherwise. A hundred percent, because these guys who are doing the canyoning tours are, are in the water for, you know, probably six, eight hours a day. Um, and the second reason we like to go at that time of year, which is ironic, is that we like to think that we could perhaps catch some of the uh, the, the end of the wet season, um, you know, and perhaps see some clouds and, and, and photograph them. And what you'll see in tonight's presentation is a photograph that I took the very first time I went there with Paul back in 2014, where it was about the only cloud I saw in the whole time I was there in 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18. I think we gave 19 and 20 a miss. And then we went back this year. And as you'll see, we had the most um, unbelievable conditions in, in both good and bad ways because we had so much rain from that cyclone that came through oh. that uh, that all the gorges were closed or most of the gorges were closed, but then also too, we had spectacular cloudscapes in, in just absolutely incredible landscape photography conditions that uh, I can't wait to show you. So it was sort of like, it's either feast or famine, it seems out there. And, and we got the uh, we got the feast of uh, clouds and stormscapes, et cetera. I've never seen anything like it. It was unbelievable. So it, I'll, it does I'll seem like it's quite the... variable in terms of, um what you may find you see there um, and you, you, in some, way, in some ways you have, you, it comes down to luck as to um, how that pans out and what's, what's happened before you get there and how much rainfall there's been and that kind of thing. It can be, yes, exactly. We've been, most of the time it's pretty consistent where you get the really nice um, amount of water in the, in the gorges in order to get great photos. There's been a year where we went and we know Gorge, one of the gorges that I'll show you tonight, um, hadn't had any water flush through it, so it was pretty festy and, and not very photogenic. And then, of course, this year we had several occasions where we couldn't get into the main gorges during the workshops um, at Ideal. No, let me rephrase that. The days that we had planned in order to go into those specific gorges weren't the days we could go in, so we had to reshuffle everything. We all got our shots in the end, but it was a bit of a logistical nightmare when you're... Um, when you're there and, and you've got a limited amount of time to um, to try and get everything done, and yet some of the gorges were, were closed for some of that period. So we shuffled things around, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later. You did Luke, ask about um, professional guiding, et cetera. Yeah, I was just about to speak to that, yeah. Yeah, we don't, we don't offer that on our workshops um, just because I, I don't think it's – with our clientele that we tend to attract, I don't think they'd be really up for that. And, and even then, if you went into those places, I don't know that you're getting a lot – lot of other great photographs that you couldn't get elsewhere you know what i mean there's lots to do outside of those specific areas where you need to have professional guides 
Um, if you were going by yourself or with a friend and you were young and fit and nimble, you may absolutely want to um, book in with those guys and go into some of what they call the, um, what do they call it? They call it the off, I can't remember the name, but, you know, off off track, off. off yeah, uh, I can remember the name, but they, they do often involve um, abseiling and rappelling down things. Um, they yeah. often involve swimming. Uh, and needing sort of water-based gear. And, and if you're with a group already, that, unless it's a purely photographic group and they're slowing down the whole drip and, and, and targeting everything, you're not really going to be able to be, be able to photographing much of all of anything anyway. I guess you could maybe potentially hire a private guide to do that. But again, for the amount of effort and bang for your buck you get for the, the number of photographs you get, I'm, it's, you know, I'm with Tom. You know, if you're just, if you're young and want a bit of fun, I'd say go for it. If you're serious about photography, you, you're probably going to get more bang for your buck um, sticking to the more accessible places. Yeah. Um, that being said, like it's not that hard to waterproof your gear and something we'll probably talk about anyway to get just a little bit further and a few places here and there that are fairly reachable that, that's potentially worth doing. Yep. And um, in terms of the location, we, we probably should bring up a map at some point and show where it is. But oh, um, I, do, I do have a map, a detailed map of Karajini, but I don't have one in situ as in this. Oh, is yeah. Well, I was just interested too yeah, if you like continue that on with other things in the area. I suppose it's quite remote, but um, is, can it be combined with other, like if someone was to travel yeah. there, could they travel oh, somewhere else yeah, um, oh, and see some other things? Often people that are doing sort of laps around Australia will include Karajini because, as you said, it's not close. How we get there is we fly from Melbourne to Perth and then we go Perth to Parabadu, which is a mining town um, with about an hour and a half from the National Park. And uh, you can fly there most days. There's the, the, most of the planes are filled with miners who are going in and out of uh, the Parabadu mine sites. And what are you looking at for a, a flight ticket? Yeah, is it... Don't talk about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say. It's got to be, it's, I, I think I spend about $1,000 to get there when you go yeah. from the Perth and then Perth to Parabadu um, return. So it's not cheap. Those internal flights in WA are expensive. You know, Perth yeah. to Kamanara, Perth to Parabadu, Perth to Exmouth, Perth to Shark Bay. You know, there's yeah, I've done the generally world speaking world. outside of COVID, there, there's there's usually plenty of flights available, but they they don't come cheap. I I um one year and might might talk about this during the presentation. Actually, flew to Perth, spent some time with my brother, took my son Ollie, and um, we actually drove up the west coast and took um, five or six days to get to Karajini. So. Uh, it's uh, how many Ks? It'd be about 1,400 Ks, I reckon. It's probably the equivalent of driving Melbourne to Brisbane. So it's not something you do in a day, but you could go up via Geraldton, um, have a look around there. Then we went and stopped off at, uh, you could do Calbarry on the way, of course, Hut Lagoon if you're shooting aerials. Um, and then also we did um, Shark Bay, of course. And then you can drive up through Carnarvon and then head inland um, before you get to Exmouth and you can end up at Karajini. I think one of my mates did it recently and he also went out to um, Ningaloo Reef and, and went with the whale sharks as yes. well so that you can do those sort of things. Yeah, it's kind of directly east of, of Ningaloo, really, um, roughly on, on a map. Um, but driving-wise, it's it's faster if you're coming up from the south to cut inland before you get there. Um, but it's yeah, it's all big driving country out there. Yes, um, I might. I've got, a, I've got a bit of a map here to just give you a rough idea oh, where things, things are. I might just quickly show you guys that. Is the screen sharing all right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's just a literally just a photograph I took of a map. So by saying that, there's Ningaloo Reef basically over there on the western side and straight across down here. We've got uh, Parabadu, we were talking about flying it on. Tom Price is probably the major town of sorts in the area. Um, it's a big sort of mining area, to be honest, around here. And Karajini Drive is the main sort of access point into the park proper, which is just sort of to the north over here. And you can loop around at to the top. And I've actually done a bit of a trip into Wurundu. We'll talk about that later. But that's um, that's fairly closed down at the moment for uh, for its asbestos mining. Yes. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you'll see. And then you got Karatha and um, sort of Port Hedland sort of up to the north. So that's sort of um, it's basically in the, in the heart of the Pilbara, really. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's considered Newman as another sort of access point, but you can you can get there from Newman as well. There's flights into Newman. It's just a little bit further than what Parabadu is. And then in terms of um, accommodation and that kind of thing, is you know, can you stay relatively close? Yeah, there's only one campground in there, Dale's Campground, uh, and then there's the Eco Retreat, which is the main sort of conventional. Um, 
uh, what I hear is that, well, I'll let you speak to this map, Tom. You, it's fresh in your mind than mine, mate. Yeah, no worries. Well, you, there's two places to camp. There's a public campsite at Dale's Campground, which is right next to uh, Fern Pool, Fortescue Falls, Circular Pool, and that Dale's Gorge area. So if you're looking at Karajini, it's sort of made up of four or five main gorges, as you can see on this map. So in the far east or to the right, you've got Dale's Gorge. And as um, we were saying there, you've got a campground right there. Then you've got a gravel road that connects the sort of east with west. And if you're heading west to the left of the um, screen here, you'll end up at um, the Savannah Campground slash Eco Retreat. That's a private um, campground. You, you, you book in there and um, you can also stay in the, the nice um, safari tents there as well. They have a restaurant that you can eat breakfast, lunch and dinner at. And that's very central to Joffrey Gorge as well as Hancock Gorge and Wino Gorge, which are probably the premier gorges in Karajini in which to get to. You're literally 10 minutes drive from those gorges when you stay uh, at the eco retreat, whether it's camping or whether it's uh, a little bit more plush than that. So it looks uh, like so there's kind of two main zones there, the other, the eastern and the western there. That's yeah. correct. Connected yeah. by that gravel road. If you drive from one or the other, it's about 45 minutes or so. Okay. Um, outside of this map the visitor center is kind of in the middle of it, which is definitely worth uh, a look yeah. it's, it's a great structure. Yeah, the the and then we've got hammersley out to the northwest which is another um separate kind of area that's more of an afternoon sort of place isn't it tom yeah um, it is we we generally sort of spend an afternoon to get there and hang out there till sunset and then come back after that that's probably an hour an hour and a quarter away from um, this map that we're looking at now, if you're coming from the eco retreat. Yeah, sort of up um, to the northwest. Yeah, again, along gravel roads, but um, it's worth going out there because that's where Spa Pool is, which is uh, that oh, right. shot. And um, and also the geography or geology out there is absolutely incredible. Again, you'll see some photos. It's, of yeah, it's sort of a bit more open, isn't it, really, compared yeah. to the thing. Like basically, this is a big alpine, not alpine, but it's a high plateau area. And, and you just got, basically, it's, it's almost like flat on the top. It's quite unassuming. And then the gorges just sort of are like cracks in, in the earth and they just kind of fall away in these little areas. So geographically, as you're driving along here, there's really not a huge amount of undulation going on. Whereas if you're driving out to the to sort of the roadhouse here and up, this is actually really quite a big climb because it drops away. And if you look on the aerial maps, you'll see lots of big alluvial fans and things over to the north here, which are the wash away points from, from these gorges. Um, whereas to the south and to the west, it's a little bit more mountainous. I remember um, climbing a good mountain with you, Tom, actually, the second biggest uh, mountain in WA from memory. So good. So much fun. Yeah. I never realised that Sparpool wasn't actually directly in Karajini, so that's quite interesting. Yeah. Is that much well, further away from um, that area? There is. This is Actually, this is on that walk with you, Tom, that was climbing yes. up. Um, Mount Bruce. Uh, Mount Bruce, that's right. And... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was after having to do a bit of work to keep up with old Tom Mody. He was pretty fit. That's when I used to be fit, yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, it's interesting about this country because you can see it's kind of mountainous in this area here. Um, this is basically halfway between Tom Price and um, Karajini National Park. And just to the southern side of this, we stayed up there quite late. And sort of to the northern side is, is that wild kind of density kind of feel. And just to the other side of us here is this massive mining area and literally it just glows at night with 24 hour kind of activity it's it's a little bit unru unruly we're right on top of the of mount bruce and you, one side you've got this open natural kind of beautiful vista and on the other side you've just got this colossal kind of mining region it's it's a bit unnerving i found tom i don't know what do you think of that kind of juxtaposition yeah, it is absolutely. You know, you're out in this beautiful countryside, but it's it's heavily, uh, you know, um, deposited with iron ore. So there's iron ore mines all over the place. And and as Paul was saying, we chose to sort of walk up. We had a sort of spare afternoon, so we thought we'd check it out. And we walked up um, late one afternoon, probably left about three thirty, four o'clock. It took about an hour or so to get up to the top of the mountain, maybe a bit more. And then um, we stayed out for sunset and then walked back in the dark and literally didn't need our torches because, oh, really? as Paul said, um, oh, the, the glow of the morning was so huge. The track I was going to ask that about astrophotography as well. And it sounds like that light pollution would be a real consideration. Well, well, not in, in that area, it wouldn't be, okay, it yep. wouldn't be possible. But if you're in um, other parts of the national park, it wouldn't be so much of a problem. But okay. the light pollution off that mine was, was huge. So we could literally walk out in the dark without our torches and just the hum of the mine 
that runs 24 seven. They've got these um, trains that just go back and forth from the mine site out to Karatha, you know, or, or the nearby coastline. And they just dump the iron ore there and ship it off to China and come back and do it all again. Well, they, uh, I do remember from that. These two from Tom Price, like if, in terms of what I'm showing you guys in terms of um, one of the bigger mining sites, it's pretty, it's pretty significant. It's a big part of the culture out there. And, the only bonus for us guys is it means we get access to um, really lots of really good four drives <laughs> because there's so many there available for the for the mining sort of company and you really do want them when you're out there really. The old that was one two three four I wasn't sure there was four or five but yeah it's a pretty big yeah. pretty big uh, pretty good road trains going on out there. Um, here's another kind of a little bit more detailed map of those the, the intersection of those main sort of gorges. Um, it's sort of, they, they kind of flow into one area. There's an area called Junction Pool in the middle where both we know and Hancock and Joffrey all sort of roll into one place. Um, this is a bit of an idea of some of the ones that we'll sh show you shortly. The Spider Walk, Kermit's Pool, Amphitheater, they're all really iconic areas to sort of shoot. The Handrail Pool is another sort of major one. But you'll get to a point in a lot of these where you just can't get any further and not without sort of abseiling equipment or probably even permits and permission really, to be honest. Um, and yes. there's big sort of safety issues in terms of that. Some of the gorges, you actually literally have to climb a fairly decent sized ladder to get down onto Hancock, for instance. Um, so we're sort of painting a bit of a picture that, that uh, you know, but it can get, some of them are a little bit high sided. A lot of them have water through them in different areas. And if you don't want to get your feet and go up high, it's fine, but you're also sort of risking the higher you go, um, you know, the, the further you fall. So it's just something to be conscious of in this area. And literally, Tom, I just realized talking to my friend Glenn, the first night we arrived there, the first time ever, we actually had to assist in, in part of a major rescue where there'd been a school group that had gone out abseiling and they'd literally got caught after dark and mm -hmm. the whole of the school was still in there. It was like oh. 18 kids or something. And we had to spend like half the night trying to find them and guide them out and, we had radios where we sort of found them and discovered them and used that to sort of um, liaise with the emergency services. So, so actually literally my first night there was doing a rescue. Yeah. Right. Um, wow. Yeah. So I wow. guess, you know, we're probably painting a serious picture of the place, but you know, I don't know how many thousands of people come through here every year. It's, it's very, very popular and very, very public and, and quite well managed as well. That's another, actually literally a bad photograph for one of the signs that's just flip fading away. But again, Joffrey Cord sort of, feeds into into is this Hancock if I remember that's uh, Hancock on the right and and yeah. we know on the left yeah yeah there we go um and I sort of don't have another map that um this is a bit of a broader sort of map of um we see from the aerial point from the gorges so this is Hancock coming into the side here this is Joffrey coming into the bottom here this is we know coming into the top here and this is moving out towards sort of Dales Gorge over here so literally the water's going south to north here west to east here, kind of north to south here, and they meet up in, in junction sort of area in the middle, and they'll, they'll all start flowing off to the east. Um, so you can see from, um, this is actually um, Glenn's, my friend Glenn's um, uh, map on Lightroom, which basically shows where he's been photographing. So so not many people get in here, but I'll, I'll when Tom sort of needs a bit of a break, I'll, I'll tell you about a bit of a story of how I got into Geoffrey Gorge and uh, paddled my way down on a blow up. Twenty dollar pink boat, very exciting. <laughs> no way, that's awesome. Yeah, I'll I'll let you kick off from here, Tom. I'll stop sharing and um. Yeah, right. Okay. If you want to, if you if you feel ready to start showing something, or yeah, yeah, I'll I'll share my screen, and um, we can have a look at uh, what's going on there. So you should be able to see my screen there now. Is that right? Yep, sure can. Um, uh, where should we start? Where should we start? Well, let's start at the eco retreat where we stay. You know, um. This is um, one of the accommodations that you can stay in. These are the luxury safari tents they have there. I wouldn't exactly call them luxury. They're just um, a nice little spot where you can stay where uh, they've got, um, you know, uh, a, a bed and, uh, and a nice little veranda, some tables and chairs, a, pri a little private en suite, et cetera. So just your sort of typical little safari tent there. Um, the only thing I was just thinking now, the only problem is there's quite a few of these tents and at night, the noise travels 
so far in the dead stillness of the night that you literally can't make a noise afterwards uh, after dark. Anyone will hear what's going on if you catch my drift. And so, not, um, not, the, best, not the best honeymoon spot then, Tom. Not the best honeymoon spot at all. In fact, <laughs> one trip I did have um, a couple next to me that got quite uh, amorous, shall we say, and uh, I could hear everything. Let's just uh, leave it at that. Uh, that's uh, moonrise there over one of the. Oh, it's always nice to just get a, a photograph with the tent. That's literally just walking into the tent. Flashing your flashing the lights in the tent on and off, you know, for for half a second, and then and then walking back out again, sort of thirty second exposure, that sort of thing. It's nothing like Lukey's Astro, that's for sure. Um, I think this one here um, is a little bit of sort of old drone stuff that I I took just to give you a sort of feel for where that eco retreat. Oh, sits. that's great. And you can um, see how the landscape is really flat. I was talking about, and the gorges <laughs> just kind of fall away into right. them, like it's quite deceiving. Yeah, yeah. So this year is it's the eco retreat is right next to one of the gorges, which is probably not the most photogenic gorge, but it's still worth looking at, which is Joffrey Gorge. So you can literally um, walk from the eco retreat just you know five ten minutes down here. And uh, Paul, they've actually just recently put a whole lot of ladder systems into Joffrey Gorge as well for people oh, to get into now. That's new. Yeah. yeah, which is new, and I don't know that I like it because that was a really nice little climb down into there. But anyway, that's you know. That's what they do. I've seen know. some sketchy climbs down there in the past, Tom. That's probably oh, right. it is. It was sketchy before. It was kind of had some really big sort of steep or, or long drops to get down in there. It was fun, but um, they've they've alleviated that now with um, with those uh, those ladders. Um, another good spot to go. Um, oh, let me show Joffrey first because we're there. Um, yeah. If you get into Joffrey, this is what you can sort of see. It's this. Um, it's like an, a big amphitheater. And then you've got this uh, waterfall that sort of cascades down these uh, series of steps. So it's not, as I said, the most spectacular place, but nonetheless, it's, um, what is this? Oh, Tom, is that one of the spring fed ones that's pretty consistent or is that a little bit more? I would, I would think it probably is, yeah. Oh. Were you Bring getting the audio? with that soundscape, mate. <laughs> Were you getting the audio of that as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, Nothing too spectacular other than um, if I take you into our stormscapes for um, for this year, which I was going to talk about later, there's a really nice, I did have a really nice shot of Joffrey there, but I don't know, I, I must have left it out. But anyway, um, here's a little bit of um, video showing you Joffrey Gorge. Again, I'm sort of jumping ahead, but this sort of gives you an idea of the landscape, just as Paul was talking about Um no, no um, sound to go with this one here, clearly, because it's um, drone. But um, this is the sort of... Uh, Paul, I don't know whether you've actually been down in a lilo to this part here of Joffrey. You sort of go through the um, what they call the swimming pool or the Olympic pool, and, um, and you get to this point here. I haven't been beyond that because it's quite sketchy, but um, this, is, um, this is from this year. Check out the colour of the water, Paul. Wow, um, I didn't see that colour. Yeah, look at that. That is because of all the rain they've had. It's just washed all the dirt into the gorges themselves. Um, and there's Joffrey flowing really nicely there. The eco retreat is off to the right. Um, but the colour of the water was just epic. Um, and a lot of these gorges were closed because of that. But that gives you a feel for the landscape. As Paul's saying, it's from the top. It looks very flat. But then these, what, this water, this constant flow of water over the years has carved out these gorges to create what it is now like millions and millions of years and um and that's what makes this place um so unique in in that regard is and, well. and um I've, I've heard that um wa national parks are reasonably drone friendly is that, that the case for up there too yes correct so um so you know we had the necessary permits etc and the ranger came past and said you know Hey guys, what are you up to? And we we said what we were doing, you know, and they're like, yeah, no, that, that's perfectly fine. So they're they're very um, they were very accommodating in that regard. So yeah, yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Um, this this here, and Paul, if you feel like I'm skipping over stuff or need me to go back and do stuff, just let me know. But um, I didn't want to overshare, by the way, because there's literally tens of thousands of photos I have from this. Yeah, especially with all spot. the visits you've done. Yeah, I've um, literally, yeah, because of all the workshops I've done there, I think I've done about six or seven workshops there is, and, and done that trip with Paul. And I've also stayed and done some personal stuff as well. So I think I've done about 45 days worth of uh, wow. photography out, out there, um, which is quite significant, I guess, for quite a remote area. This is um, Dale's Gorge, which is in that far east as we were talking about where the 
campsite is is quite nearby. This is um this is a beautiful gorge. I think the more time I spend in here, the more I realise that there's so much to offer. This is actually from the top, looking um, along the gorge to the east, and uh, it actually goes around the corner and beyond this, which I've not done. It's um it's sort of off track, but I'd love to do some of that with permission at some stage and just see what else is there. But uh, there's a nice little walk down a, a ladder system again, or, or step system now, um, that uh, takes you into Dale's Gorge. Another shot here from the same location, but just with a really nice moonrise. Oh, just noting here that this is a, a panorama shot and shot after uh, sunset. I, I always find that if you're shooting, the, the problem with shooting at Karagini is the contrast, like Paul said, in terms of, you know, light and dark and, and not shooting both because otherwise you end up with bright highlights and dark shadows and it looks horrible. So sometimes shooting these sorts of shots where you're above the gorge, you need to wait until the sun's gone down and sometimes 20 minutes, half an hour afterwards, yeah. you get a beautiful glow in the sky behind you and that's what I'm getting here, this sort of, I call it the Ken Duncan hour because I think Ken used to do this or does do this extremely well. And back in the 80s when he was exposing his slide field for 10 minutes after the sun had gone down, this is the sort of stuff that people just hadn't even probably thought of doing. But um, so those reds just keep glowing. They do. And, and it's yeah. not, and, and, you know, sure, I've probably saturated this a little just to bring out the colour. But at the end of the day, people look at these sorts of photos and go, there's no way it could look like that. Mm -hmm. And you're quite right. It doesn't look like that to the human eye because the human eye isn't exposing this, this landscape yeah. for, for, you know, a minute or two. The camera can because it's exposing for such a long time. It picks up that colour. So, yes, yeah, quite right. You get some really interesting colours, but... It's not what the eye can see because we're firing out at, you know, 30th of a second or whatever yeah. it is. So, yeah, you can get some really beautiful colour in that landscape when you when you wait. And, of course, you know, the advantage of coming on a workshop is that we know the right places to be at the right times, but also we give you plenty of time to do that as well. Uh, here's Fern Pool. I hope I've got a decent shot of that from the other side just to show you what it looks like. Well, no, I wouldn't have picked that as being carriage, any. It's very green. I still haven't got a bloody decent shot of Fern Pool from the front. Every time I take a photo of it, it just looks like rubbish. But um, you literally, there's this beautiful pool that you can swim across to and you can, um, with a very wide angle lens, we're talking um, 14 mil here, I would think, um, get in there and, and literally sort of, just set up your tripod and I'm not talking about, you know, full length tripod. This is probably only a meter, you know, or, or 1.2 meters from top to bottom. So you really have to crouch in and just back yourself into a corner and um, shoot with a really wide angle lens. Here is, um, here's a video of that. I'm not, does it sound too loud or is it okay? That's good. But that does require you to swim across, um, just put your camera in a dry bag or two and float it across um, with your tripod in order to be able to get that shot because you can't walk to that particular spot. You do need to be um, having everything waterproofed. It's a um, very weird feeling, isn't it, having all of that money sort of in a, in a bag on the water it, in front it of is. you? It is so weird because uh, at the end of the day, you know, like we, we instruct everybody on what to do and they bring their own dry bags or we supply them. And the idea of putting, you know, a $5,000 camera and lens into a dry bag where you just uh, then float it across the water, people are just, yeah, they they panic. And, <laughs> and you tend to, um, I've got some brilliant video um, later on of some canyoning I did the first year I went and uh, you literally are throwing your pack off the edge of a cliff into the water oh. and, um, and hoping it survives. Here's, um, here's a little video of Ollie. This was, um, God, he's changed since now. This is probably- yeah, I was gonna say. Seven or eight, six or seven years ago. No, not even, 2017. So this is only four years ago. He was, uh, he was 10 and uh, now his voice has dropped and he's just as tall as me and uh, not, <laughs> not near, cute in a different way, I should say, in case he ever watches this. I was about to say not nearly as cute, but um, he had a ball. Look at this, you know. Great place to take the kids and, and have some fun and muck around, you know. He just absolutely loved it there. And, um, and here we are just doing a little. That's great footage. Yeah. Little, oh, little, beautiful. With the... With the GoPro, this is um, this is in Fern Pool. There's Fern Pool behind us there. So it's a it's a beautiful little just rock shelf where this water cascades off there. Um, great for a swim as well. Obviously, croc free, which we all love to hear. And yeah, um, we love that. 
And then also too, within Dales Gorge, you have um, what's called Fortescue Falls. Again, a nice series of cascades, very accessible that you can just walk right up to these falls with a wide angle lens and shoot this. And, uh, and, and in fact, I was thinking about this. This is what I call this um, backpackers falls because there's these sh rock shelves that are just perfect for sunbaking on that if you go there at the, a busy time, which is, you know, generally uh, outside of COVID when all the backpackers are here, they come in their bus loads. They all do a big trip around WA and, um, and you can't get a clear shot of these waterfalls because there's so many say, yeah. backpackers, you know, unfortunately drinking, you know, alcohol and, and sunbaking um, in this spot here. So it's probably a spot to get to sort of once the sun has, you know, disappeared as opposed to the middle of the day or anything else. Very early. That'd be probably um, a good idea anyway from a contrast perspective. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. No, ideally, I think you'd shoot Karajini mostly, you know, in overcast skies anyway. Yeah. You can go there um, outside of the sort of season, as I talked about earlier. We can't go because we obviously need the eco retreat with the accommodation and the food in order for us to run a workshop. Uh, and they don't open that until the 1st of April. So we can't go before then. Ideally, we would because you perhaps get that... Um, you know, get the, the cloudscapes and everything else and have it be a bit quieter because mm. it's so hot in that sort of summer period. Karajini tends to be quieter than uh, what it is during the April, May and that sort of winter season. Um, these are some beautiful figs that you see all through the, um, the National Park, but unfortunately around Fernpool, a wildfire went through there a few years ago and it burnt a lot of these figs and these roots, et cetera. So, can't necessarily get a lot of these um, beautiful shots like um, we have in the past, but um, you know maybe a bit of hunting and you'll find them elsewhere. But they're just on the side of the walls of the canyons. They're, they're That's it. Yeah, like as you walk right next to you, it's, it's stunning. I think it's a matter of just looking, Paul. You know, like sometimes you're so busy sort of looking where your feet are going that sometimes you miss what's around you, and it is a matter of just sort of looking up and 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 being able to pick up those sorts of things. This is beautiful, um, Tom. Yeah, reflections are just a key part of Karajini. You know, I say to all my workshop participants, if you see water, look for reflections um, wherever you are. But Karajini is full of that so that if you are in a spot whereby, you know, the gorge you're in is in shade, but then maybe an escarpment above you is in sunlight still because it's, you know, late in the day or it's first thing in the morning and the sun's just hitting that, that cliff edge above you, you can get some unbelievably spectacular um, reflections and um, this was one I took many years ago and still probably one of my favorites it's obviously got some a red gorge red cliff edge there on the right hand side I'm not sure what's causing that yellow and then you've got the blue sky um, at the bottom there so I do always enjoy looking for more of those abstract shots when I go to Karajini because it's so good for that but also too um, when you've shot there so many times you tend to push yourself to look for something different rather than just the same old, same old. Um, and again, just sort of reiterating that point, once the sun goes down, uh, you can still be in the bottom of those gorges and shoot upwards and get some spectacular silhouettes of, of trees. Again, we're still in Dales Gorge area here. Um, there's some stunning trees above Fortescue Falls that I always love seeing the last bit of light hit them and then, um, and then these stunning silhouettes. And Thankfully, we had cloud. I'm not sure what happened there. That must have been early on. And, and if you, um, it's quite a sort of, when I call it, say, famous, this is sort of quite a, an, a famous spot for photographers who've managed to find it in Karajini, um, where if you get into Dales Gorge and you actually walk away from Fern Pool and Fortescue Falls and you walk down the, the, um, the gorge itself, you end up at this curve in the gorge and if you get there late afternoon again as we said before timing's just so critical you get there too early the sun will be on this you get there too late the sun's disappeared from the cliff above you so there really is that window where you need to be to get these sorts of shots and this is a lovely little spot mm. um, that you can pretty much have all to yourself because most people can't be bothered walking down there and when they do it's a little bit off track so they don't bother sort of coming into your frame so um, this is a lovely little spot uh, Again, this is part of that as well, but this is, I've got, I think I've got this. I used, I thought I had this in a panorama as well. I, I haven't included it in the slideshow here, but um, yeah, this is a lovely spot just to hang out. We spent a couple of hours down there this year, just uh, enjoying the peacefulness of it all and, uh, 
and watching the light play across the, the water there and how it changed, et cetera. Is that one of the better places to see that sort of flat? It is um, the easiest, yeah. easily, yeah. Yeah, easily the best that I've seen. That's yeah. right. Um, yeah, it's hard to beat. Because um, what people tend to sort of do is they sort of look at a lot of photos of Karajini and go, all right, I want that, 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 and that photo. <laughs> and I think, I think they figure that they're just going to stumble across them. If only it was that easy. Um, you do, you know, sometimes need to know exactly where to go. And as I, as I said, at, at the right times in order yeah. to do the shots. Um, and that's what we provide on the workshop. I, I, I keep reiterating that. But at the end of the day, I think if you went to do... You know, Karajini, you could probably spend two weeks looking for all these shots and still not find them mm. or get to the spot at the wrong time and know you have to come back the following day. Exactly. And when you do it on a workshop, if you've got, you know, anybody, whether it's me or somebody else who's got prior experience, of course, they can take you to the right places at the right time. And this was... It this seems year. like it's really a critical place for that too. So, yeah. It's 100%. Just, it's, yeah. The, it's, the, it's the most critical spot um, that I run a workshop for light. Yeah. I'd, I'd absolutely say that, you know, but, you know, you, you always, you know, sunrise, sunsets are nice when you go to places and that's critical for light when you go to most places. But this one is actually more so because, you know, it can come down to minutes worth. There's, there's one spot in Wino Gorge that I'll show you soon where we went one year and, um, and we got there literally probably half an hour too late. And so we went back the following morning to know that we needed to be half an hour earlier in order to get a shot. So that always goes in the memory bank now, yeah. knowing that I have to be in that particular spot at that particular time of that particular year or that particular time of year. And um, in terms of the climate, um, like do you get quite a number of clear days still at that time of year? I guess your peak sort of April timing or is it sort of... It's always clear, Luke. As I said, okay. at the start, um, I, I rocked up one year, the first year that we went and uh, it was the start of April and we got uh, a cloud, I'll show you. This was the only cloud that I've ever seen at Karajini, pretty much. <laughs> um, and that was that was the first wow. year, you know, I think back in 2014. And in fact, um, Karajini is really hard to get sort of up high and away from the trees to get a, a vista, like a shot where you can look out over something. And this particular um, evening, I think it was the first evening we got there, saw this sort of cloud dumping a bit of rain and thinking, oh, this could light up. And of course it did. And I just remember being so annoyed because there was, you can kind of see it in this, in this part here where I haven't done my Photoshop as well as probably should have, but there was this tree branch in the way and it really obscured the whole photo. And I was just kicking myself that I couldn't get into a spot where I could get this shot where it was clean like this. And uh, years later, I probably only in the last year or so, I revisited this photo, took it into Photoshop and did some really sort of funky content aware fill and other stuff and managed to pretty nicely remove it. And so I'm pretty, pretty chuffed with myself for doing that. But um, yeah, look, as I said to the participants this year, you never come to Karajini and expect to see cloud. It's always just blue sky from first thing in the morning till last thing during the day. That so might so. be a reasonable target for astrophotography as well then. Um, are you allowed in the in the gorges at night as well? No. Um, uh, okay. You need special permission for that because right. it's pretty. As as Paul and I keep saying, it's pretty sketchy to get down into those yeah. places. Okay. Look, you could do some brilliant astro with some of the um, the treescapes, etc., that are in the area. I mean, well, uh, some good lookout points that would probably work for astro too, Tom. Yeah. yeah yep. Yep. Uh, Ox's lookout, for example, could work. Yeah. Although that tends to sort of face the east southeast direction. I don't know whether that's any good for astro. Probably not. Mm -hmm. Mm. East would be great um, okay. that time of year. East, yeah. well, Dale's Gorge, one of those shots that I just showed you before. Yeah. Um, but then using these trees, for example, you know, this is um, out of Hammersley Gorge facing a sort oh, of wow. north northeast oh, direction. Me. That's magnificent. You've got a moon rise oh, there. What a tree. So this is um, this shot here, for example, um, not as it doesn't look as good as this now because this was taken about five as, as this does. Five or six years ago, they built a brand new road and they literally just moved all of this earth down into Hammersley. It was quite an eyesore. It was horrible. They'd, they'd excavated all of this um, earth in order to build this bitumen road down into the gorge. And they literally just dumped it all at the base of this tree. Mm. Not all, but they dumped all of this earth at the base of this tree, right? That's and right. you literally sit on the road and then take this photo. I think I've got a shot of it here. Yeah, here. This is us taking the photo of that tree. You sit on the road, you point <laughs> the camera upwards with a widening lens, and this is the shot. That's the shot you end up getting, right? Sure. Um, and so that 
that's unusual because you don't often get again encourage any of these clear shots at trees where you don't have anything else in the way like spinifex or other bush etc cetera, etc cetera. but that was certainly something that uh worked in our favor in that regard i think i've got many photos of that same tree yeah here you go there's another one of that that same tree probably it's very distinctive you can't miss it and and, and again i'm just while we're on the sort of tangent of trees i'm always looking for trees that um have that have as the sort of distinctive shape when I, I'm teaching the other guys out there, I'm like, there's so many of these, what they're called snappy gums. And the reason they're called snappy gums is because these limbs here that you see that are brown on the trees here literally die and then just snap off. Like um, it's like, uh, you know, not needed anymore. So they literally just drop their, their limbs and, uh, and they're incredibly uh, photogenic uh, and, and they have this beautiful white bark mm. and, I just find that there's so many of them that you really got to sort of choose your uh, choose your tree because you don't want to compromise because at the end of the day, you might choose a tree and you go, oh, yeah, it's okay. But if you really search for that really nice tree, as we've shown you there, you can get something that's quite spectacular. And, and as the fires go through, they create sort of different effects with these sorts of things where you've got, you know, some that are not, some that are, this has been affected by the fire. So it's had that, got that sort of, it's got that sunburnt look to it, that brown tinge. But I just, I love, Paul was talking about books and, and I'd love to do a book just on the tree trunks of, um, of these trees and eucalypts, et cetera, throughout whole Australia because I just think they're so bloody photogenic. They're just marvellous. Um, this is down in Kalamina Gorge, one of the gorges we'll go to in a sec as well. There's beautifully big paperbark trees, mm. uh, very photogenic, except it looks like there's, no, no, it's, that's rock. It looked like that's rock as well. On my screen, it looked like that was like um, garbage bags or something. But uh, no, and you can see that here the flood water has pushed all of this sort of debris into this tree here, for example. But but that's is it true what they're saying, Tom, on YouTube that um, that you'll piggyback people out of the gorges if you're tired at the end of the day? Is that <laughs> that's <laughs> level of you offer? This is this is absolutely true. Well, you know, like that's where we need to go into some of my. Uh, I know I'm flicking around a bit, guys. Sorry about that. But this is where I need to go into my general views, where we've got photos of like the walk down into the gorges, you know like this that they, they could be pretty sort of steep they're not they're not overly long they're not overly long literally no. you can you know i think the longest time that you can spend walking down into a gorge would probably be hancock gorge and that for a fit person would take 10 minutes you know so it's not that long but um it is quite steep and you know they've built some nice little sort of stairs and, and walkways etc now but no i don't fancy piggybacking anybody out of there jan was <laughs> jan was was nice and light she was I'll be back here any day, but uh, no, not anybody else. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, any questions? Any other questions to sort of pause or are you happy for me to keep going? Tom, did you know. want to show a couple of pictures of, of the physicality of being in the water and getting through it? Like there's a few shots there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a sense of, you know, what you're dealing with. And I guess we talked about it, but the visuals really make it. Yep. Make yep. it real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me show you that. So, you know, you've got some... Um, I think this will sort of show you here. Um, this is one of the spots we go to at a place called Wino Gorge that if you don't get there early enough, you get that light, as you can see here, guys, mm. where this, this is sunrise, the light's creeping down into the gorge. And if you get there too late, then you've got that bright hot, hot spot above your, your lens there. So that means that um, you're not getting the shot you want. Um, and the shot that we want from there is... Uh, this one here, which was taken this year with a wide angle lens. Yeah. Um, so the tourists sort of not there at that time of day. Yeah, that, that's cool. right, Nick. They're, they're sort of still sleeping in. And if they're camping at the other campground, they haven't driven across yet. They're sort of, yep. they, they, they're not keen to get down there first thing unless yeah, they like, first. <laughs> have the place to themselves. So um, we, we try and get in. And I did, I did steal this term from, um, from Tony Hewitt, who used to run a lot of workshops out there with Christian Fletcher and Peter Eastway. We get down there before the bikini brigade gets in, which is, yeah. you know, the girls and guys in the swimmers, uh, bathers who come down all they're interested in is going for a swim and then uh and getting in your shots so if you get down there sort of before nine or ten 
it, you can generally have the, the place to yourself, which is obviously desirable. Is there an actual open time, Tom, as well? No, there's not. Okay. No, there's not a, no, there's not. An, they don't. They don't. They don't have barricades across the 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 uh, gorges or roads or anything like that. As such, no. I think they've, they've made it. A bit, I was just talking to Glenn, like. Um... Like in the days that I went there, there was no there's no permits needed to do anything day based in the park anywhere really, but if you want to go overnight anywhere, particularly anywhere that's away from the designated campsites, and there's only a couple of them, then you, you do have to get a permit. So it's quite a big process. It takes about three weeks, and they want proof and evidence of your skills and qualifications and the equipment you have and all this kind of stuff. It's a bit bit quite a bit to it. Um, but day by stuff, you, you you're pretty open to where you want to go, and as we'll, as I'll show later, you know, you, there's there's some pretty epic trips you can do, way beyond the obvious spots here. Mm. Yeah, and I'm not aware of those pools, so I can't wait to see what you've got because um, I can imagine that there would be some really interesting stuff to see outside of uh, what we're showing tonight. That's for sure. Yeah, no, uh, no Instagram is where I was going, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we like it looks, that. Um, it looks like quite a large park outside of the the main gorge area too. Huge. Yeah, yeah. you're quite right, Nick. There's a lot of stuff um, that's okay, the second largest in WA, and that's saying something. Right. Mm. Whoa. Yep, there's a lot of stuff that just doesn't get seen because it's um, it's not accessible, so mm. to speak. Spider walk. The spider walk, yeah, the infamous spider walk. It's hot, so you know it's hot. It's probably 35 degrees during the day, and um, only sort of 20 degrees overnight. So if you're going to go swimming with your camera gear, you just wear quick drying shorts and t-shirt, and uh, you know you enjoy the refreshing swim. Uh, or walk through the water and then you uh, you dry off on the other side and it generally doesn't take that that long, so to speak. Mm. Um, where are we here? Um, this is the, the the walk down into a place called Handrail Pool, which is in pool. No Gorge, yeah. And there's just a bit of chat on the on YouTube that it, that's closed at the moment because of some fatal accidents. Okay, Ooh, so... Um, yeah, right. That, that doesn't surprise me. Um, I, I could share some stories, but probably not tonight. But um, somebody died in here this year, mm. yeah, um, before we got into the gorge because they were coming down this handrail um, and let go for whatever reason and, uh, and bumped their head and, uh, and didn't recover, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, look, it's, it's not the place where you want to um, take risks, that's for sure, because, uh, you know, one wrong move, and it's not going to be a, a fun trip for you. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, um, is this is this stuff guided, or do you guide yourself? No, we are guiding ourselves here. We are in um, parts of the the gorges that don't require any professional guides or permits, right. um, as such. So, therefore, uh, we this is just generally this is where the general public will go as well. For yep. example, yep. So that was at the end of Hancock's that last one, that previous one. I don't remember. Hey, hey, what's Holly doing? Yeah, here? previous oh, one. Hey, Holly. <laughs> this one, not that one. This one here. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where that one was. It could be. It could be like we know. I said the Wino. Yeah, I'm just trying You're to getting into a bit of Wino action there. I'm not 100 sure. Well, you, know, you notice, like, even though it's really intimidating first about the the dry bags and and the cameras, they actually float really well. Yeah, that's it. It's not like they're sinking down the bottom and you're just sort of hoping they're taking a breath. That most of most of it's kind of almost above water. And so it's actually far more effective and, and less stressful than you think. Yeah, there is. And that's, that's, right. that's me there. I've got my f stock backpack on, which has got a great waist harness. And when you've got your dry bags in there, because they're full of air, they just float, float. float upwards. So it's like having a life vest on, really. Um, do you we, double dry bag as well? Just yeah, bloody hell, I double dry bag. <laughs> yep, yep, 100% I double dry bag. Um, just to be 100% sure. Oh, wow. Yeah, they are just swimming across our little... Nice stroke action there. Kermit's pool. Yeah, but, um, yeah. You can walk around the side here on the right, but it is quite steep and slippery. Oh, would you? <laughs> These, um, just on that, um, Tom, do you have any, um, any advice on the footwear that you should be using yes that's a great question nick yeah um apparently dunlop volleys are the best footwear to use for grip now i've not used them myself because i took teethers and other stuff and all these other things that you know cost a bomb but do nothing and they make it actually more slippery 
I like the tactile feel of my bare feet on these rocks. And so I feel very comfortable going barefoot. We walk down into the gorges with our hiking boots on uh, because you're walking over sharp rocks and uneven ground, et cetera. But then when you get to the point where you need to um, go for a swim or wade through water, we just take them off, leave them by the side. And then I'm very happy going with bare feet. I've got pretty, um, pretty tough soles. And, uh, and I love the feeling of just walking on these rocks with um, just my bare feet, not for everybody. I've got, um, I've got a pair of Keen water sandals, which have yep. closed toe on them, and I find them the perfect compromise because they're designed to be in water. And they've got a reasonable grip, and they've got a good toe bash sort of um, yes. on the end. So that, that's probably my favourite for a carriage. Any but being a – like it's an old trick for rafting guides, like even going down like the Franklin River, they recommend to clients to buy Dunlop Wallys because they – the actual true. type of rubber they use for the base is, is fantastic. We've just got an idea about that now. And if you part. want to get the primo stuff, um, all of the guides on the Franklin use um, 510 stealth rubber. That's so that's the, on, that's the that's the ultimate. Profession, it's a professional climbing. Very hard to find and, then and expensive. But wow. That's the, yeah. And they're like full like walking boots um, with very, very soft rubber on them. They're quite expensive, but they're, um, they're amazing on grip-wise. As you can see, moments like this, they come in really handy for your confidence. Well, this is really tricky. And, and even I get pretty um, nervous it. going down these for the first time because you've actually got to um, straddle that, that handrail. And the handrail is not um, thin either. It's quite a thick handrail. So yeah, it is, actually. It's not easy. And, and you, you, if you've got, you know, poor Janine, she's got little legs. She's not the tallest person in the world. So she's you know, struggling to get to those um, steps either side, but you can go down one side if you want it as well, for example. And then if the pole gets wet, that doesn't help either. Oh, well, mm. that's the thing. As you can see from that screenshot there, Paul, you know, like um, there's a lot of the water there this year and uh, it's coming down here, there and everywhere. So you're getting water in the face and, and everywhere else. So it wasn't um, it wasn't the easiest start certainly this, this year in order to be able to get um, through these spots. But, you know, it's just a matter of just taking caution, you know, like just taking it slow and steady and not rushing, thinking about every footstep you take. Ideally, you have your hands free and you have three points of contact. We, we talk about Mark Stoddard, my, my friend taught me this, where you have your two hands and at least one foot on the ground at all times. And that yeah. way you can just arrest yourself if you need to. Um, you can never be complacent because at the end of the day, um, as soon as you stop concentrating is when something will happen. And, and you don't want that to be the case. So. Yeah, Paul, do you want to talk a little bit about your adventures through there? And then I can come back and talk a little bit more about some of the- Oh, course. yeah, I can do that. Bit of, a, bit of a side trip. So, I mean, Nick was sort of talking already about the, um, well, if you stop sharing the screen time, I'll share mine. Um, uh, like in terms of, uh, you know, there being, uh, I think you need a co um, maybe a co-host again, Lucky. What was that? Sorry, Paul? Yeah, I think you need to make me a co-host again. Oh, because you bumped out. Yep, no yep. problem. Because it is a massive national park and, and it's kind of, um, yeah, it's it's huge actually. Um, and I'd say a lot of the national park, most people are probably never going to get to really um, just because it's, it's yeah, it's, it's huge. And a lot of it's not particularly accessible unless you have a certain sort of skill set. So it sort of, I, I won't say was a time of my life, but <laughs> it certainly has been a time of my life where, um where I'm um, just checking on the right catalog here. Oh, wrong catalog. How uh, many funny catalogs have you got, Paul? Oh, God. Well, I was having to get, because this was, these were so long ago, I literally had to go through um, some older catalogs. And um, I was just talking to Glenn today about whether I am, um, whether I'll just let that load up, how, blending catalogs. And I did yes. learn how to um, upgrade old catalogs to the new developing settings which i just figured out today that was that was pretty handy but then put all of your uh i put all of my say wa photos into the one catalog and then all of my within that i've got collections so Caragini, kimberly etc cetera, etc cetera. so all of my wa photos are on the one drive in the one catalog okay. yeah so geographic yeah okay it yeah, wants a little bit more time based generally right um but it's yeah i mean it's 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 an issue when you're getting to a moment like tonight i'm like oh that was 11 years ago, that trip. Where, where are those? And yeah, exactly. What year did I go? So which hard drive would that be on and which catalogue would that be in? Yeah, it's a management thing. I was, I was talking to Luca today about um, whether I just blend them all into one 
and uh, I have, crazy, I have crazy, crazy I, massive catalog. <laughs> what's what's made me nervous is um, I have one catalog of quarter of a million images where every single image has disappeared off it, and there's yep. no previews, and it's gone totally blank, and it's yep. Yep. rattled I, rattled I, my faith in the system of it. So running around and randomly blending them all together, hoping it's all going to work is, I thought, oh, maybe I'll just worry about that later. How long ago did that, did you try that though, Paul? Because I tried that about 10 years ago with Lightroom and put 100,000 photos in a catalogue and it just shit itself and it wouldn't load up any of the thumbnails. No, it's fine it's now. It's got a lot more robust. Um, 250,000 in mine and it runs fine. So How many in yours, Lucky? Uh, at least 250,000. Right. Yeah, I've, I've, oh. you know, I've got... Rocky. I think a 350 in one, 250 in another, another. I'm, <laughs> I'm heading towards a million. So um, I'm wondering whether I should blend them in one catalog or not. It was an issue a while ago um, that yeah. it's, it's slowed it down. The, the sort of rumor is, is that it's, I don't know if it's not an issue at all, but it's certainly far, far less than it was in the past. Um, and the convenience, depending on your work, work style, um, there's a lot to be said for that. And moments like tonight, it's actually taken up a lot of time for me to actually access everything and go back to the drives and It'd probably be a good show topic to do. I was going to say, yeah. and, next week's topic flow, is... that sort and next thing. week, what do you have to Tom? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> need to find someone that's actually on top of it and then oh, I'll talk to them. <laughs> I don't talk yeah, to who them. are those people? Who are they? Oh, there's a book that I bought years ago that I never read, which was on all digital asset management. Damn. That's what it's called. Yeah, Damn. Damn. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah I remember that one. God forbid. Wow, what a dry topic that is. But essential, you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, you want to be able to find your photos easily enough. Sounds good. As, as thrilling as colour management or something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So maybe get <laughs> Les Walkling on for that. <laughs> and then block out block out um, the whole evening to about midnight. <laughs> yeah, take it. Take some notos. He's unbelievable, <laughs> that bloke. He's amazing. Come on, Paul. Show us some pictures. Yeah. Well, the annoying part of it is you open a new catalog every single time you do it updates the XMPs, which takes like five minutes. So, well, how about how about good. I go back share screening uh, yeah. my screen and let us know when you're ready to go? Yeah, yeah. I'll be ready. You got heaps to show us, Tom. So, let's yeah, go. Yeah. I do. So, look it's outside cool. of Dale's Gorge, another another couple of gorges that are obviously great to get to. One's called Hancock Gorge. And Hancock Gorge is where the sort of premier shot is, which is called Kermit's Pool. Kermit's Pool because it uh, takes on that sort of greenish colour. Yes, absolutely, I've uh, played with this. I, I find that the colours on the gorge walls tend to be a bit too red and orange for me, and then the, the pool never looks um, – it looks too green. I don't like that. So I've added a fair bit of magenta to this in order to have this um, look the way it has, which is uh, magenta being my um, – my go-to colour when I want to spice things up a bit. <laughs> um, beyond this, you just saw the, the video of them swimming through this little pool. It's really not that far at all. This is a pan, wide-angle lens, um, pano-stitched. It's literally, you know, 10 metres from there to there. Um, this little window can glow if you get the, the right time of day as well. But if you get the wrong time of day, this is a bright, blown-out highlight. So um, this once you go to that spot there, you get to uh, this spot here. And this is again is one of the sort of premier shots oh, from yes. Harajini. Yeah. I call this the shoot, although strictly speaking, this isn't the shoot. The shoot is actually around the corner and beyond where you need um, you need uh, harnesses and canyoning and all the rest of it in order to be able to do that properly. But um, again, what you're seeing here is the how critical light is because if you get here at the right time of day, you'll notice that above in the top of the frame here, we haven't got any bright highlights from the sun shining directly onto the cliff, but we've got this beautiful red glow here of the sun from above there. So um, yeah, you often get a golden sort of look to that glow if you get it just, at the right time. Just bring it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure if there's a, that's taken at 10, 14 AM, if that's correct. Uh, that seems a little too late for me. I wouldn't be surprised if that's Melbourne time rather than WA time. So maybe take a couple of hours away from that. Maybe it's a quarter past eight rather than a quarter past 10. And the you vast to... majority of the shots that you shoot um, would probably not have the sky or the highlights from, from the sun hitting the side walls. No, I'm trying to avoid them at all costs yes. because it just becomes so distracting, Luke. Yeah, and then yeah. I guess you've got plenty of dynamic to range to worry dynamic about. Dynamic range well. is, a, is a massive issue, which is pretty much yep. especially anywhere in, in Karajini. So you want to be prepared to, to, to be doing some HDR sort of work down there. Um, I mean, you can, you've got pretty good dynamic range on some cameras now, and obviously with the right timing, like Tom's done here, you can avoid that to some extent. 
but it, it's certainly something in your mind, uh, constantly in the back of my mind when I'm shooting down there is, is this going to land in a single exposure bracket or not? Yeah, I, I think, uh, Paul, though, um, these days the, the cameras are so good. I stopped shooting HDR four or five years ago because I just find that the dynamic range in most of the cameras these days is so good that I don't need to blend the exposures. And I purposely want to either be shooting into the shadows or into the highlights, but I'm not trying to mix the two. So I'm not I'm not trying to shoot shots where I'm including both the sky and the gorge itself. It just it tends to not really work out for me. And I just, I can't be bothered trying to blend the two. I just don't think. Well, I, think it, I think it was present to me because I was literally having to blend some this morning because they were shot 10 years ago with the camera. Yes. Didn't have the dynamic range to handle it. And they, right. they didn't come out of single exposures. And, and I guess camera. with the cat, with the yeah. walls too, like you, the, the sky is probably going to be clear and there's no like, ferns or anything sort of coming down from above so oh, it might be brutal. quite boring it's, having it's that it's a brutal that, contrast yeah, yeah. yeah and also right. tom just um ralph's asked on on youtube if um you use any nds or any other sort of filters at all oh i don't i don't really feel the need to because it's quite dark in these gorges anyway um i'm finding that i'm getting a, an exposure that is allowing that water to have that nice smooth effect anyway um so no um they usually uh, stopping down the aperture to, anyway to get the yeah get the, um the uh, depth of field. Depth of field. So this is ISO 100 at, at two seconds f11. You know, at um, so therefore I'm not needing an ND filter on this one in order to get that sort of key one second or more exposure to create that um, you know that nice blur on the. Oh, is that a stitch? Because you shot 50 mil on that one. It is a stitch. Yeah, it's a pano stitch. Yeah. Mm. So this is um this is actually um an off off uh you know track uh, spot to get to. This is not something you can easily get to, although it's easy, it's it's one of my favourite photographs. This is a place called Regan's Pool. And the reason I show this one is because I love the photo, but also to that previous shot that I showed was taken up here. And in fact, you can see um, the, the rope across, which which tells you not to come any further. I, I was here with the um, canyoning guides who have permission and led us down to this particular spot. Um, but that's where that little pool ends up. So that's the previous shot there. So I'm taking the shot from here in the center of the frame where my cursor is. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but um, that's where that previous shot is looking back. Yeah, right. Is the rope in that shot, um, the previous shot, Tom, the rope? Uh, this one here? Yeah. No, it's not. I'm shooting over the top of the rope. All right, so you're at yep. the rope. That's yeah, the, I'm at the, I'm at the rope. Yeah, yep. you don't want to go any further than that because it can yep. get quite slippery. And you're really doing... slippery, oh. that one. Super yeah. slippery. So you go in the other way from the, there's another entrance to the other side. And there is I'll, another entrance to the other yeah. side, and it is um, again off limits unless you're with the canyoning guides. Got it. You can come up from a place called Junction Pool, and you can come up via the chute, which is this here, and this is a big long sort of walk up through here, yeah. and then you go around the corner, and you end up here. Cool. And you actually can, when you do um, a day trip with them, you can start in a place called Knox Gorge. You can go uh, over the waterfalls at Knox Gorge end up um, in a place called Red Gorge with your uh, tube, your tire tube, because a lot of it's quite deep water. You paddle with your tire tube to a place called Junction Pool. You end up um, coming up through the chute there, like previous shot, this one. You walk up there, you end up here, you come over the top here, you walk out um, via Kermit's Pool, which is here, and you end up at the car park, but it's a whole day. That's a whole day. You know, that's sort of 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. Are they good with um, allowing you to do photographs? Like it's not rushed. Um, or... It depends who you get. When I went, which is which is different to now, there's a different uh, guy running the the operations out there. They were quite conscious of the fact that they didn't want us in particular spots standing there for too long because you could get easily get some rock falls from above. Even though you're wearing hard hats and everything, they just were pretty sketchy about us standing around for too long, but long enough to get your photos. Yeah. I've been standing, taking that shoot shot a couple of times, and both times I've had groups come, canyoning groups come through, <laughs> walking straight past me, down through it all. So uh, yeah, yeah be, right. Be ready for that. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, here's a little video of the same sort of thing here. Didn't quite nail the depth of field on that one there. Um, is that the Hello. sort of place where you got to line up for the shop because it's at the yes. right there? Yeah, oh, yeah. correct. Um, so there's there's uh, 
there's a couple of reasons why we only take um, six people on our workshop is because when you're going into these gorges, there's not a lot of places to stand. And so yep. therefore you're sort of splitting the group in two and you're sort of saying, right, you guys stand over there and get those shots. We'll stand over here and get our shots and we'll swap over. So yeah, yeah, right. yep. yeah there's not a lot of space. Um, Calamina is a beautiful gorge. It's quite an open gorge. It's not nearly as deep as the other gorges. Very easy to get into. We actually go onto this on our first day because it's just a nice, easy introduction to, um, to Karagini. Big paper barks, as I talked about before. Um, lovely sort of serene spot. Mm. Uh, mm. You, and you can explore pretty much all the way down this gorge. I've not done the whole thing, but um, there's some lovely little spots like this here uh, where you can... There, we're sort of mixing the two, as you can see there, both light and dark, um, shadows and highlights, but that's worked quite well, as you can see there. Um, that's just a video showing off the same sort of stuff there. Mm. Um, but Calamine is a lovely little spot. Um, and another shot of the... Oh, it's a bit less visited, though, isn't it, Tom? It is, yeah. It's not the sort of specky spot. We actually got into there in the evening uh, this time round because we're sort of filling in time, waiting for the other gorges to open up. And coming out of there, walking back up to the car sort of late in the afternoon, captured this light hitting this beautiful snappy gum and was actually surprised at how many good shots you can get in there sort of late afternoon. I'd only done it early morning with my groups um, in previous years. So uh, I really enjoyed it. That's um, obviously sort of more of the harshness you get when you're shooting both the highlights and the shadows. But then you can sort of get yourself into a position where you might sort of capture something more like that, where you've got these shafts of light coming through the gorges and you sort of use that to affect where I... nice black and white, Tom, that one. Well, here's one I prepared earlier. No, mm. <laughs> no I haven't done that yet, but um, you're quite right. You know, Paul's identified that, in fact, this has got sort of quite a lot of... Um, oh, yeah. Quite, quite a lot of contrast. So if you're going to be... Uh, you could use that to affect, as you can see here, you could play around with that and, and get something really nice there too. Mm. That's um, Kalamina Gorge for you, which is uh, one of the, as Paul said, the less visited. Knox Gorge, um, this is the one that I told you about. Now, you may well know this photograph here, not my particular photograph or, or this one here, it's the same spot. Um, Ken Duncan shot a really nice pano of this many years ago. A Verderama pano? A which a vertical pano? Or? Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah, a vertical pano that ended up um, being in one of those reflection books. Remember the reflection yep. series that he brought out, where the spine was at the top of the the, the book, um, and um, and went pretty hard with the color. I'm not sure how he got the incredible aqua blues that are in the photograph. Um, I think there's a bit of mayo in that itself. But we did it twice when we um, did our canyoning through there. We did it once where we had the sun in the shot like you've got here. And then we went very early in the morning to get this shot as well. But you can probably see in my shot here, um, there's guides up here just waiting. There's this big rock that sort of blocks the entrance. And then you've got to be guided over that. And then you end up um, literally sitting at the top of this waterfall, right? Um, back through the other side there, there's this beautiful banding of, of, mm. of colour here. This, I just love this shot. Look at the colour in that. Just absolutely spectacular. That's literally the other side. What you're standing on here is the top of another waterfall. Um, so you turn around 180 degrees and that's the shot you get looking the other way over the next waterfall to get down. Um, but in the meantime, let me just get my bearings. Um, this, I'll talk through this video and I'll probably just switch off the sound because it's really not that interesting. Um, this is what's required in order for you to get that shot. Now down in here, is where you're standing to take that those photos that I just showed you, right? And in the meantime, you've got all this, the canyon narrows, narrows, narrows to the point that you can't sort of do anything else other than sit on your bum and you'll watch, uh, you'll watch my mate here. And the water pushes you and it gets so steep that literally you just get pushed off the waterfall and you, you end up Ooh, landing geez. in that waterfall below, right? No good. It's so good. Um, so what this involves is obviously all your gear is in um, dry bags in your backpack. Um, I'm putting the backpack on my lap. On your front, yeah. On my front. And uh, sorry, I think I'm probably wearing this as a head cam. And, uh, and then you're literally etching yourself forward to the point of no return until the water actually pushes you off. And then you throw your backpack in front of you so you don't land on it. And then you're in the water. <laughs> 
and then you come up and there's your backpack floating there waiting for you to uh to go and grab it it's pretty impressive because according to someone on youtube your backpack weighs the same as a small person so <laughs> <laughs> now now this is way so much time this is when you know you're getting old up until uh, probably six months ago i used to pick up pick up my backpack and think nothing of it and yeah i used to have two two bodies in there you know maybe a pentax 645z with three four lenses a drone um the the tripod you know attached to it it probably weighed 15 kilos at the very least um which isn't too bad but then more recently i've started to pick it up and i've gone oh, this is ridiculous you know like i'm really noticing the weight of it um probably need to go to the gym more often that's probably the truth <laughs> but um yeah, shoot on smartphone you'll be right i, I hang this, out with it, martin Hawes. did i well well funny you mentioned that nick because i went to um arnhem land earlier this year and i actually on day one like literally the first shoot we went on my camera my pentax with a brand new wide angle lens was sitting on the seat next to me and we went down this big hole and the camera just went flying off the seat and landed on the aluminium flooring of the oh, no. car. Bent the lens on the on the on the um, camera. Meant that I didn't have a wide angle lens for the whole um, workshop. And I ended up shooting most of the workshop with my uh, new iPhone 12 with the wide angle lens on it. <laughs> and so that's when I came to realize how good the new iPhones are um, and how much I enjoyed shooting the video stuff on that in particular. But also to um, I then, I then sort of made the realization that I wasn't going to replace this lens that I, I wanted for all that time. And I'd swapped into the Nikon Z7 system. Um, mm. I won a Nikon Z6 with a, a, a decent lens last year. And I decided to sell the Z6 upgrade to the Z7 because it's got 46 megapixels in it. Mm. And now my kit, which is the one body and two lenses weighs 1.6 kilos. Mm, yeah, so, going mirrorless says massive like advantages. Yeah. Totally. I, I love that idea. All I need is a 70 to 200 at f4, and I'll be a happy camper. I'll have three lenses, and I've gone from 2.8 lenses to f4 lenses. And I used to be the biggest snob on earth because I used to go, Oh, there's no way I'm shooting with f4 lenses, superior, inferior quality, you know. Yeah. They're now, look, who wants to? Sh we don't often, as landscape photographers, shoot at f4. We're more shooting at F11, F16 for the depth mm. of field. In the past, I think, yeah, sure, maybe there was a compromise in the quality of the lens from an F4 to a 2.8. You'd go for the 2.8 because it had better glass. But a problem with that is, of course, the weight. Mm. These days, I'm finding that if you buy the specific F4 lenses that are made for those mirrorless cameras, the quality is absolutely outstanding. And I tell you, I wouldn't be using them if it wasn't. Yeah, so, we've um, we've been getting the um, Z5s with the twenty four to seventy uh, f four f4. for our yep. for our work. Yep. Um, I I haven't got them for my personal work, but I uh, some of the other regions have got them now, and um, they're fantastic um, lenses. They're really really good. Yeah. So that's the same lens that I'm using the twenty four to seventy f four. Mm. Um, I'm using the fourteen to thirty f four. That one looks and, great. Yeah. And as I said, I'm just waiting for the seventy to two hundred um, f four as well. Um, built specifically for mirrorless and then i've got my whole kit awesome and, and and while we're on the topic um what would you recommend for like if obviously also you you have to really restrict the amount of gear that you take when you're in carriage any yeah um what would you recommend or to, to people to bring in in yeah. this i'm assuming a wide angle would be it's great. great yeah it's a great question the widest the better i tell all my workshop participants if you haven't got at least a 16 mil lens get one because you'll need it for Caragini. Everything's really tight and you'll want a wide angle lens. Um, this is one of them sort of more open. This is this is at uh, 21, for example, mm. but um, the, you can't go wide enough for Caragini at the end mm. of the day, it's, mm. it's pretty tight. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and then stitching is another aspect to consider when you're in Caragini um, for a number of locations in particular. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Um, this is down in um, oh, wow. it's down in Knox Gorge. So this is just showing you before we get to that waterfall, what's that like? I'm not spent a lot of time in Knox Gorge. Um, Knox Gorge is infamous for the fact that it has pretty shaly and very sketchy um, track to get down into it. And I've never taken my workshop participants there before. I took them there this year because, again, we were waiting time for the um, gorges to open. And um, that's where uh, Nick Melodonis had his accident. And, and some of you may know that story where he, um, he fell off a cliff face first, six metres down. 
and, um, and literally was lucky to be alive at the end wow. of it all. So, um, oh, yeah, that was Knox Gorge. Uh, this is this is um, where these. Uh, this is where we found one of these um, beautiful fig trees that hasn't been burnt by the fire. Um, but isn't that just glorious? Oh, and that light. So what you find with Karajini is that if you're in the right place at the right time, you it's like a softbox. It's like you've got this studio lighting on this on this um, tree. You can see there's light coming in from the right. There's light coming in from the left, and that's just reflecting off the the cliff. You know, faces that sometimes are hundreds, two hundred meters away. But it creates some beautiful soft light that um, really is stunning for your photography. That's for sure. Mm. Mm. So there's um, there's a little bit of Knox Gorge, and then um, you happy for me to keep going, or Paul, you wanting to jump in? Well, right, you, you finish up, Tom. I'm All right, mate. Yeah, I'll finish up. Um, I won't keep you too much longer. Um, we know Gorge is spectacular. I think it's one of the most sort of red gorges you can get into. Really, um, this is where mm. Handrail Pool is. Uh, this is a little bit of a pool that you walk through to get through to Handrail Pool, which is on the other side of this. But before you get into this section, if you're brave enough, you can sort of climb up onto a rock ledge and get this lovely shot. Um, this is at the end of Wino Gorge. This is shooting over the uh, over the rope again into um, the abyss where you can't go any further unless you're uh, canyoning, guiding, et cetera, et cetera. That's a horizontal shot of the same view here. This is a stitch pano looking straight down into the water that's flowing underneath you. And there's a horizontal shot of it. Um, this is this is the critical spot where we get to it. Uh, I think it's about 10:30 in the morning, um, beyond Handrail Pool, where if you get there at the right time, the light is shining through um, onto the rock face around here to the right. Actually, I tell a lie. This is actually actually I've stuffed this up. This is actually Kermit's pool shooting from in the pool itself. I'm standing sort of like chest deep in water shooting through into that little reflection there. So I'm not going to make up that story. <laughs> I've got, this is, the, this is the spot. This is the spot. It's a little video where if you um, are in Wino Gorge at the right time, you can get this most amazing. And you'll just notice I, I just lean the focus back here. Um, but you can get the most amazing light coming through the gorges there. I haven't got the still shot of that. There you go. Tom, um, and Rob yeah. I had a question from Robert um, on YouTube, just um, if you can recommend a waterproof setup or maybe even if that's actually necessary in the, in the, in the gorgeous. No, or? no, you don't need a waterproof setup. Right. All you need to do is just go to Kathmandu or um, actually the Kathmandu dry bags aren't that good. Just get the heavy duty dry bags, get enough. Cedar Summit. Cedar, yeah, yeah, Cedar Summit's good, yeah. Sorry, what's that? Cedar, Cedar Summit. Summit. Yep, Cedar Summit's awesome. You know, that's probably the best quality. Get Something two awesome. of those. Yeah. Um, get one that's slightly larger than the other. Put your camera inside the small one. Put the small one inside the larger one and just float it across the water. Or um, I don't I don't like anybody carrying anything, as I said, um, unless it's on their back because you want to have both your hands free. Yeah. So I certainly wouldn't recommend carrying anything as such because you got a tripod as well. Just... Um, you know, put it all in. The F-stop bags are great because you can take the ICU, the internal compartment unit, out of them. You can put in your dry bag, zip it all up, put it on your back, put the tripod on the outside. Remember to take everything else on the outside that's going to get wet out of the uh, backpack there and just walk with it and it's brilliant. Do you get so, any abrasion on the pack at all? I've seen people wear holes in them because they're wet and they're oh, yep. rubbing against rocks and, and that kind of thing. Uh, I've found that that material they use for the F-stop bags is really good now. Okay. The, the first generation bag that I had that uh, was probably 10 years old, I actually had to throw it out because of that. They didn't mm. use the best quality. And in fact, um, the UV disintegrated the material to the point that it did rip. So I ended up throwing that out and buying a, a, a newer one. Which was, well, yeah, they did change the material, didn't they? They um, did, yeah. yeah, they yeah. Got better and um, in terms of the bag management and what you put in the bag, you, you mentioned that you don't actually keep put the ICU in the in the dry bag. Do you have anything just to... Do you oh, no, I'm sorry, I do. I'm, no, sorry, I do. You're yeah. quite right. Okay. So what I tend to do is take the ICU, put that the camera in the ICU, zip it up, and then put that into the dry bag if you've got large enough dry bags. But if, if not, what were you asking... Oh no, that was that was I guess the question is if you use the ICUs still, otherwise you'd have all your gear just sort of bouncing around, around. in a dry bag, yeah. um, which isn't very um, a good idea. Oh, and you then you have space then for your lunch and other bits and pieces that you need. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's right. You can have space for that if you wanted. Um, also, to you could wrap it, you could put a towel, you could wrap your camera gear in a towel and put that inside the dry bag, which would help you know cushion it a bit, and then you've got a towel to dry yourself off if that's what mm. you want to do. 
when you're unpacking your camera gear, for example. So that that could work as well. Great. Thanks for that. This is a great having the video too, Tom, just to get a um, full idea of what's involved. Yeah, look, and what I haven't shown you um, is that um, if you jump onto my um, TomPartWorkshops.com website um, and you click on the Carry Genie link, there's actually a carriage. There's actually a really nice little video here um, that that goes for two minutes. That we, we may as well show it now. That actually yeah. gives you sort of like a, a summary of what we've done. Have you got anything lined up for next year, Tom? Or is it a bit of a weird time to do that sort of thing? Uh, no, we do because of the lockdown. We're, not, we're not seeing it, Tom. This, sorry, we're not seeing it. Yeah. Oh, hold on. You might have to, you might have shared the um, Lightroom window. Um, I have. That's the, exactly um, what I've done. So I'll stop yeah. sharing, and then I'll share it again. Thanks very yeah. much for that. Share, no share the desktop. Uh, this should you should be seeing Ollie and yep, I. Yep. Got it. Yep. Yep. All right. Sorry about that, guys. You're Can right. you hear me as I talk yep. over the music, though? Yeah, the music's pretty loud. We can turn it down a little bit. How's that? That's good. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, because of the lockdowns this year, we had people from various states who couldn't make it. So we're actually full for next year and uh, we're taking bookings for the year after. So, yeah, cool. we'll go back. Absolutely. Yeah. And do you ever run more than one or is it just um, a bit tiring to do that? We did this year. And in fact, what I had is I had a five day workshop, a six day workshop with a weekend off before I started the next one. And because of the rain stopping us getting into the gorges at the right times, um, literally I was going to be putting people from the first workshop on a plane without and going home without them having gone into Dales Gorge or Wino Gorge, oh. which are the two premier gorges. And, and so we came up with this plan um, to actually have them just move all of their flights back to Monday. And what we did is then um, I worked over the weekend and they stayed in a couple of days. Um, rearranged all the accommodation which was a nightmare and lights and car hire and everything else and uh, thankfully we didn't know this um, 100% this was going to happen but in fact uh, what they did do was then they opened the gorges up on the Saturday morning which is when everyone was supposed to be flying home and um, we got into the gorges and um, they got all the shots they wanted. Oh, so well done. I worked 12 days straight that day. Well, that and that's not easy terrain to do that too so well done. No. Oh, well, that was at the start of my five weeks away um, God, look at the color saturation in that. The uh, the five weeks away, where by the end of um, those five weeks, I was pretty exhausted. Oh, and the responsibility, Tom. It's there's a, there's a bit more weight on your shoulders taking people through here. Mm. Yeah, and it is. And you know, like I probably, I probably, um, as I said earlier, I love going there and I love sharing that experience with other people. But by the same token, I consider that I've sort of dodged a bullet every time I get out of there. Without, happening because it is it can be so sketchy you know what i mean at the end of the day um if if one thing happens that um is a bit untowards it's going to not make a pleasant trip for anybody mm. um all right one last one is um let's go to let's go to spa pool um i don't have any great shots of spa pool that i'm really happy with i've probably got them in my files that i could probably go through and have a bit of a look but um, this this sort of got spa pool got sort of put on the mat a few years ago with Ignacio Palacios who um, who went there to the shot and uh, worked the the bejesus out of it to just create this beautiful sure uh, landscape yeah and um, that sort of won all these awards and everyone went Jesus Christ where's that and um, that's this is spa pool and it can literally look like this where it it is incredible it's it's like it's blue on one side and then it's orange on the other due to the weathering of the rock and perhaps what's been exposed to the elements, et cetera. Um, that, there's that beautiful, it's very small. It's, it's funny, I've been there and I've actually had tourists come up to me and go, where's that waterfall here? Um, and I say, oh, that one there, pointing to Spa Pool. And they go, no, no, not that one, the big tall one. And I say, no, there's no big tall ones, that's it. They see these photos and they think that that waterfall is a lot taller than it is. There's no sense of scale. No yeah. sense of scale. Yeah. So that waterfall from top to bottom is about four or five feet. <laughs> so it's tiny. And yet they see this and think that it's huge. You know, that they uh, could, you know, 10, 20 metres high, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. literally that, that, that pool in diameter is probably three metres, no more. <laughs> yeah. But it is a spectacular spot. It's a pain in the bum to get to. Um, it involves clambering down some really um, sharp rock that is on a really 
acute angle, which makes it really difficult to get down into. Um, and, and then setting up a tripod, there's a nightmare as well, because you're on this rock that's standing at a 45 degree angle. Um, but spectacular nonetheless, you've got this really interesting strata, um, great for a swim. You get some stunning reflections off it. This is spa pool behind me on my right, over my right shoulder here. And this is a place called Hammersley Gorge, which if you get there late afternoon, you get this stunning um, reflection off the rock wall there. And again, you can pretty much have the whole place to yourself. Mm. Um, besides a few local, you know, miners who have a day off and want to go there for a swim, for example. Yeah, it's a little bit of extra to get effort to get there, but it's as well worth it in my in my mind. Yeah, some beautiful um, snappy gums as we talked about here. A um, little bit of drone action that sort of shows you the um, the sort of geography of the place. This is looking the opposite way um, down that way. It's not very interesting. Um, but you can't sort of get beyond that, so to speak. But it's really interesting rock. Oh, this is um, probably a shot this pool when you were with me. There's somebody diving into Spa Pool right there. Yeah, oh, there right. Wow. And there's this rock that you've got to set up your tripod and you've got to walk down it in order to get into Spa Pool. It's really sketchy. I see yeah. you know what they call it, that just based on the size and, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I can imagine that... Um, if you wanted to, you could get some, you know, some really interesting walking done through all of these gorges. Mm. Again, we don't encourage you to do that unless you've got the necessary sort of permissions to do so. But um, there's That's all of this stuff to explore um, outside of what you're seeing here. And just this beautiful sort of mountain range that I love taking people to sort of photograph late afternoon. Yeah, it um, really does look like there's a lot more like above the surface of the gorges too there to explore and um, maybe not so, um, so easy to find a shot, but um, certainly the, those white trunks with the, yes. the, you know, the blue sky and the, the red dirt um, is, is a pretty good combo. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. The contrast between those colours is fantastic. This is actually taken, this is an unedited photo, excuse me, it looks like it, my horizon needs to be corrected there. But um, this is actually taken this year and um, Paul and others who might have been there already might notice just how bloody green it was. It was absolutely, yeah. absolutely um, incredible. I've never seen it so green. And then you had these most amazing colours and then the water being that sort of very brackish sort of brown from all of the silt and uh, sediment in there, as you can see here. Um, and and again, there you've got that light that's coming from behind me, hitting the cliff behind me and then reflecting onto that tree there. The last thing that I did want to quickly show you was sort of this year, I call this storms of 2021, where um, previous to that, the only clouds that I'd ever seen at Karajini was this one here and, and told the workshop participants that you, this just doesn't happen. So this was literally um, a drone sort of panning left to right. There's the main road that leads into the national park on the right-hand side there. And um, it's a bit grainy because it was very dark, but this was the first lot of sort of thunderstorms that greeted us as we arrived at Karajini um, for this particular workshop. And Paul, this is taken from the restaurant at the, at the retreat. Uh, so what I can't remember the name of that cyclone that came through Kalbarri earlier this year that did all that devastation. But what happened was, um, was if you looked on a satellite map, and I don't have a, a copy of that, was that um, once that cyclone went through Kalbarri and sort of swept through the rest of, you know, the sort of southern Australia, which is what it tends to do, it, it comes down from the north and then it gets, it gets caught up in all of the... Um, in the westerly airflow that comes across Perth and Fremantle and then it gets swept across the sort of southern part of Australia, right? And once it did that, um, it dragged a whole lot of cloud from um, off the coast of the Pilbara onto um, Karajini, right? And so we're there and we're just day after day is just all this cloud. Like you couldn't believe our eyes, made for some nice sunsets and sunrises, of course, if you could get in the right spot shown that already, but the colour of the water, for example, here, the flooding of the gorges, the gorges being closed, um, the roads being like this, where you've just got these massive oh, wow. puddles that um, were safe enough to drive through, but um, they certainly didn't, um, there's a cloud cover and you're used to seeing blue sky, made for some um, interesting patterns on the cars, um, of which if you took a really nice close-up photo of that, I remember posting this on Facebook, Fantastic. telling people that um, this was my latest aerial photo and lots of nice comments, but it's literally where uh, Steph's and Julie are, are pointing to there. Um, they got, the cars got hammered. Um, there's two of them in the car park there back at uh, mm. Tom Price, I think it was. 
Um, I cleaned one of the cars, but one of them I didn't have time or couldn't find a car wash. And that cost me, I think, $200 to get it clean. Um, so they know how to charge. Um, but this was the sort of the, sca- the cloudscapes we were getting. This is the top of um, Joffrey Gauls, looking at from the lookout there. And there's just all this rain around us. We couldn't believe it. Just it was absolutely spectacular. Mm. One afternoon, I, I think I like to say that I'm reasonably good at my intuition. And my intuition told me this afternoon that we needed to leave the retreat and go to the east out towards Dale Gorge and just go driving because otherwise we were just going to be sitting there twiddling our thumbs waiting for the gorges to open. And I said, come on, guys, let's just go for a drive. Let's go a bit of storm chasing. Let's see what comes of it. And this was out towards Dale's Gorge where I pulled off by the side of the road and said, guys, we need to get up high to get this storm. So let's go for a bit of a hike. It won't take long, but trust me, I think it'll be worth it. And this is the video. And if I turn up the sound, you can actually hear the rumbling of the thunder in the background. And mind you, the lightning that was coming out of that storm, right? Mm-hmm. So we get to the top of this, this, um, this hill here. And then you can just see this is a drone panning mm-hmm. from the south across to the east. Oh, wow. the way to the and yeah. this, is, this is a very slow moving thunderstorm. So this wasn't sort of all windy and moving at a million miles an hour, one minute's there, one minute's not. Literally, we could have stayed up there for two or three hours and pretty much got the same view. And I actually pulled the guys off the hill after about half an hour. I said, we're not staying any longer because this storm was getting closer and the lightning was getting more frequent. And I said, we're, we're one of the tallest things at the top of this mountain here, guys. We're not hanging around. So mm. we headed off down. But you can see the extensiveness of that storm. That's a same shot taken from the ground where we had this beautiful low rainbow. Um, There's the guys taking some shots here and including the the snappy gum in this shot here. This is another shot that I absolutely love it. I I could have, this is paying homage to Christian Fletcher because I think he's shot similar sort of stuff out the Pilbara and using that very sort of desaturated look where you sort of pull the color out of it rather than going for the full intense color. That's a, a drone pano stitch of that particular storm and then you know driving all right guys let's go let's get away from the storm that's an iphone shot of us um, taking the storm here with the light i said if we can wait until that sun comes out we're driving along this road just storm chasing but i said if the sun comes out i'm pulling over sun comes out we pull over you get that beautiful contrast between obviously the light the road being lit up and then the uh, the storm clouds in the background and this is my process version of that photo probably a little bit too much magenta never thought i'd say that um but, uh, <laughs> that's that there i actually sold as a, a beautiful print um only recently but um it's not it's not far off i mean obviously we're using a little bit of creative license there but when you get those conditions just mm. just unbelievable oh, yeah that yeah, the dark sky behind really? the light. So, so good. yeah, this is Dale's Gorge. This is just from the top of Dale's Gorge. Mika's got a very nice shot of this too, with um, not from our trip, but um, from previous trips she'd done there, where she's got a beautiful cloud over this uh, over this mountain as well. Absolutely stunning. And then back at camp, you know, just hanging around, uh, and then this cloud just decides to light up with this moisture coming out of the cloud there as well. So um, there's lots more to show of that particular sort of experience that we had this year in the, in the gorges there, but that's sort of a quick snapshot of what we, what we got with all of those um, storms that we had this year, which is absolutely incredible. Yeah. Amazing. Probably need to get on to you, Paulie. I've stopped talking. I yeah. will stop talking, believe it or not. Yeah, I, I was like, we're talking. almost finished. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, I was oh, Paul, you guys trying to put this stuff together. That was brilliant. brilliant You've met your equal, Paul. I, I don't know. Tom's Tom's no. Tom's, Tom's come before me, mate. So no, just in terms of talking. Yeah, What's no. that? Um, are we going to try and push through and create a record tonight? We're almost up to two hours. Uh, no, no, we're not. <laughs> do um, I'll do I'll do I'll I'll have to go these pretty quick now, which is a bit of a shame because some of the stories are pretty good. Sorry, stuff, Paul. Um, this is the pink lady that I bought for twenty bucks at the local uh, store, <laughs> and we decided. To take this down this crazy <laughs> ass gorge, sort of as you do. And it was a bit of a walk in here, like it was off track, sort of bash. Um, I think I had a, a map for just before where we literally sort of walked 
across, oh, which school is it anyway? Across like open plain sort of into a sort of area that we slowly sort of bashed our way down into Joffrey Gorge. And Joffrey is, is you know, it wasn't actually very regularly accessible, uh, not easily anyway. And it sounds like they've sort of done something about it now. But so there's Glenn with his pack raft and, and his actually breakdown paddles in there. And we're bashing our way through the spin effects and <laughs> everything else, which is not, not really for the faint hearted. So, Tips like this uh, are probably not for your everyday punter, but um, Glenn's the kind of guy that's crossed the Patagonian ice cap and, um, mm. you know, walked up in the Himalayas. And he's actually done some pretty amazing trips with Grant Dixon, actually, to different places like that. Uh, so pretty rugged sort of terrain getting in there. Um, and then we're just eyeing up the water levels. And it's the kind of trip you don't want to do on low water level because you'll end up carrying your uh, boat more than you will by paddling it. Uh, I didn't have a paddle, so I actually took off my sandals and just used them to <laughs> paddle down the river. And I had my full-size backpack, and um, I had to race down to keep up with these guys because me being me, I'm always taking photos. And by the time I got down there, they're kind of ready to go. So I got left behind, um, and but luckily I got left behind with the pump because otherwise I might have been there for about 45 minutes trying to blow that thing up just with my lungs. But I'm um, really starting getting in there uh, and obviously not the kind of place that everyone gets to, but um, that's the starting point. And we were there, I think August, what was it August? I'm trying to remember. Um, does it say, okay. no, no, not June, sorry. Um, because it's a little bit indicative of what time of year is so or what kind of water level you're going to get in there. And you don't want to be doing a trip like this with no water, but at the same time, uh, you don't want it with too much either. So uh so Glenn was the most organized, had a proper sort of boat where you literally uh, put his paddles, paddles in. This is my mate, um, Dave Holder, um, who's very, very experienced in, in this sort of area. He'd actually just done a nine-day trip through all the backcountry the um, um, year before we arrived. So we, he had a few clues, and we decided we were going to do a few things a little bit, a little bit different from the masses. And, uh, yeah, there's the pink lady getting ready to go. She's a beauty. <laughs> a little block pillow as well, you know. That's <laughs> make things sort of super comfy. Beautiful, gorgeous. And, you know, I think I had my camera out the whole time, to be honest. Um, cool. It was just too much of a too much of a hassle to take it in and out of dry bags and um, try and get shot. So, low, um, actually, the best shot I got on the whole trip was right at the very, very end of this. And there was, in this particular time, there was three sections that we had to walk through. And literally carry the boats across as the water kind of ran out like it's not a big long flowing kind of uh, body of water normally um, and it's a bit slippery carrying a sort of boat and extra things over there but it's um oh it's well worth it and we made it all the way down to um junction pool which is the point where um all these major gorges actually meet mm. and as tom was saying it sounds like they've actually built something into to actually enable enabling people to get down there you'll see the lookout at the end of this sort of series uh, that's sort of getting near the end of where we got to. There's there's Glenn um, and his boat. You get a sense of the scale there quite well. It's 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 pretty decent size. Yeah, you can actually see the lookout platform up top there if you look closely. Oh, yeah. So uh, a fairly big fall <laughs> if you if you do a wrong step. So when Tom's talking about yeah dropping down in there, that's it's yeah it's not a small feat. We did see some people doing it at the time. I was I was doing the Tom putt special with the bare feet there because I was using my sandals as a paddle. Um, just had charcos, I think, at the time. Actually, that's another not not a bad option for down there because charcos are designed to be rafting sandals, so they actually have extra good grip and um, they're quite simply designed, so they last a long time. And they use particular rubber that that uh, is quite grippy still when it's wet. And I was just talking to Glenn uh, this afternoon about this trip and a lot of the um, beautiful kind of uh, these features at the end here. That this these particular trees here are now oh. just just tiny stumps. They're pretty much gone. Oh, no. And I got down here and I was just like, oh my God, what a, well, I'm just going to go to town with this. And, oh, and of course the boys were like, oh, it's getting late. You know, we better get going back. It's a long way. Like, yeah, yeah, of course. Well, I'll see you up there, mate. See you up there, boys. Huh. And I was so freaking late that uh, they ended up sitting at a rescue party for me in the dark because I was, I was down not the here. the first time. Oh. Uh, not, the first, <laughs> not the first or the last. It's not the first time. I was fine. I was just doing my thing. I've yeah, had yeah. a fair bit of experience and um, I don't think Glenn knew me as well as he knows now to sort of trust me to be able to um, handle myself. But uh, so it all worked out fine. But um, but yeah, these are gone. These are totally gone. Yeah, Paul, these are, the, sorry, I missed it. These are the, the trees at the bottom in Junction Pool, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, right at the bottom. Yeah, they have gone. Yeah, they've just been washed away and 
disintegrated over time. There's a tiny little side canyon that I'm not so many people have probably been through, but it's um it's one I found as I was going down there. And uh, I did spend a little bit of time in there. That's another reason, one of the reasons I lost the boys because I was like, oh, what's down here? Oh, what's down here? I got Paul, let's go over, look, where? And next thing you know, where where the boys gone? <laughs> And uh, well, I, had, I was pretty well set up. I had all the right gear and I had a compass at the end for a bearing to get out and I had night torches and a bit of food and first aid. I'm care. assuming there's no, no chance of any reception anywhere around there either. Uh, yeah, no. Nah. So that, that's actually the side cannon. It's me sort of pushing the boat in as far as I could. You can see the little, um, those trees that are gone now sort of down the bottom. Mm. I was, uh, I got pretty fond of the old pink lady by the end of that trip. Um, it does sort of enable you to get places and shots you, you never get otherwise. True. And, uh, you know, for 20 bucks, it's a no brainer. You can see my, my charcoal paddles there. <laughs> um, and my, uh, my, I had the big pack with extra gear just in case something went awry. And that's getting a bit of perspective about where they were. So yeah. I was really sad to hear that from Glenn. I don't know they're gone, but um, uh, I haven't got it here, but I did a black and white of this, which is. Oh, that's a stunning shot, mate. Yeah. One of my, I did this in, in, in black and white where I just isolated this feature and. Um, mm. I was going to say it. off the bottom. <laughs> Sorry, but it was yeah, it was it was a, it was a stunner. Have um, you still got the raft, Paul? You're going to bring it back? Oh, I, you know, I gifted it in the end to oh. to um, some other people because I was just like it was a bit, it was quite a heavy thing to be able to take home. Uh, but it's uh, it's it, it got more life put out of it. So so here's actually the six day trip that we did. This is um, essentially pretty much off track. Uh, the main area that we're talking about, the gorges, is kind of over this way. And Fernpool is sort of at the end of Dales Gorge. We pretty much walked, started at kind of Dales Gorge and went off a side canyon, walked all the way through, spent the first night here. We don't even know what the name of these canyons are, to be perfectly honest. Um, we went up through the bottom of this and camped here for two nights and did a lot of exploring up and down the gorges so we could just really focus on shooting. Mm. Then we wandered through here. We climbed out of this gorge, followed a compass bearing across, dropped into another gorge here, made it to this intersection of another sort of big gorge coming through here. And then we kind of got caught. You'll see why later we couldn't get through this any further. And we're just running off these sketchy black and white maps from some bushwalking club from like 40 years ago where somebody went through because it's, they're not the kind of areas that many people go to because you, mm. you want to be fairly prepared and fairly well skilled with the navigation and, and um, first aid and that kind of thing just to take these on. And there's also the issue with there's not a lot of water around and, and you might be sucking out straws or, or just, we weren't totally sure what we were or weren't going to find uh, in terms of these different kind of out of the way gorges. But um, so here we are setting off pretty decent sized packs and um, yeah, Tom will be doing Tom proud, like, like these things around. And we had another gentleman, Rob Gray. Um, he was actually, I don't know if you've heard of Rob. He's a, he's a quite a he's, prolific photographer. that has been around Australia, going around Australia for years, like literally living. In a, internet a, sensation. What's that? Is he? Yeah, oh, I've discovered him on the internet years ago. Good on you, Rob. He yeah. probably won't feel it. There's Rob there, actually. Absolute gentleman. He was in a six-wheel army truck that he um, that he rebuilt out, especially to live out of with his wife. And uh, and they literally spent years and years and years just trucking around Australia and, and just shooting and living on the road, basically. And um, it's quite a prolific yeah. photographer. There's David. So it helps a bit of teamwork, getting up the sides and um, getting around these slippery edges with a fair bit of weight. Um, because as you can see, you <laughs> see, you don't want to be you don't want to be falling off too easy. It's not not quite your uh, grandma and grandpa day walks out here. But uh yeah, good fun. I've kind of had the gators for um spin effects and also snakes. Not a bad idea to um have them floating around. Pretty steep sided. Did you see any snakes, Paul, by the way? Uh you know what? It's it was surprisingly quiet on wildlife, I found actually. Oh. Uh, much less so than I expected. Uh, a lot of insect life though, and quite a lot of bird life. Mm. Um, that was our camp, I think, on the first night. Great shot. Oh. And um, yeah, I like how the blues kind of matched inside of the tent. I did the old, um, put the old uh, camping torch on on the inside there. And you know, some of these gorges are, you know, there's no tracks or anything, so you're just kind of finding a way. And all of a sudden, you might sink up to your knees in a in a wet hole, or or um, you know, jump on a sharp edge, or or find a whole bunch of cutting grass. And the cutting grass was actually quite a big feature of the whole trip. And at the end, it actually was the very feature that, that stopped us going any further because we came across 15 foot high um, valleys of cutting grass from oh, edge, yes. edge to edge across the canyons. And it's like, yeah, hello. Um, it's a definitely beautiful something that you don't want to be doing solo either because you need somebody to help you out getting up those steeper parts of the gorge, but also too, just from a safety point of view. 
Oh, certainly. Yeah, I mean, these guys are all pretty experienced and, you know, I've been a guide for 20 years. So between the four of us, we, we're a pretty solid bunch. Uh, but none of us have been down these areas as well. So we're, it was a very exploratory trip for us and we didn't have um, that much information really, apart from some sketchy old maps and as much as we can get a hold of. Um, but that made it part of the adventure. And I guess when you're an experienced walker, you're, you're looking for things that kind of give you a bit of a push and, and are a bit of a challenge and, and, and are in the unknown because, you know, the known is kind of like a different quantity and it doesn't give you the same sort of experience. So it was, yeah, it was pretty, you know, it made it pretty exciting. Um, you know, I was pretty confident heading out with these guys. But again, you know, it's not like easy walking <laughs> every day is a bit of a adventure and how are we going to get through this bit and is that going to be under our armpits through there or can we step across or who's going to be the guinea pig and, and go across first or um and then there was a lot of other areas where it opened out beautifully and, and it was quite open walking and, and the vegetation and flora was just stunning in terms That's of like some sort of a she oak or grevillea or something isn't it yeah it was a bit grevillea like i think Mm. And Paul, um, how, how what, what are you talking about distance wise from end to end on this sort of six day? Oh, trip? you know what? I can't actually remember. We, we probably were doing maybe four or five hours a day. Um, yeah, and I guess the, because of the terrain, distance isn't so much of a consideration. Yeah, it's not so much a distance thing, really. Um, we gave ourselves a bit of time, and we're all photographers. So we were there to photograph as well as explore. So, mm. so we designed a trip where, you know, like we literally spent two nights in the same camp, for instance, at, at the intersection of these two gorges so we could just shoot. Um, and we tried to do everything. So, you know, we shot in the morning and walked during the middle of the day and, and got to shoot again at night. So, so it was a photographer's trip, which which is often not the case when most bush, bushwalks have been on. Mm. We are literally just dragging your feet and racing around trying to keep up with everybody else just to be able to shoot anything. And so it was a real treat to actually not only be in the company of photographers, but actually design a trip in a way that you you had a bit of time to slow down and actually be present. And, um, and I learned a lot from them because they're, they're pretty experienced guys, um, not only as bushwalkers, but as photographers as well. Um, and at that stage, you know, this is probably... I don't know, 10 years ago or so. Um, it was a lot, um, that had a lot more collective experience than me individually. So, so it was, it was a really good opportunity to, to bounce off some of the best. And again, you know, it's things like this. You don't catch when you're walking past. It's only when you get to slow down and do a bit of detail work and break out the macro lens. Um, it's a spider's web or something. Yeah. It's some sort of web, but I like it. I like how it sort of ripples into rainbow effect and mm. with the movement. I'm not it's quite sure. highlights. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I still, I still scratch my head when I saw this. I found this this morning, and I was like, "Yeah, right." Um, you know, bark detail on one of the side of the trees, and I'm with you there, Tom. Um, that can make a book in itself, my friend. Absolutely, love it. So, I uh, campsites are what you make of it. So we we <laughs> we pull them pull them together, and uh, the comfort factor is not quite the same of your regular bushwalking trips. There's there's no sleeping on the soft, uh, cushy grass patches or anything. Is that your old um favorite seat there, Paul, or someone else? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's 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 kind of dead now, but um, <laughs> that was uh yeah, I got a bit of a lesson on, on panoramas here from Rob, uh, which was good because I'd really done too many uh, before this. Really, not I'd done it by hand, but not not actually slowing down and doing it deliberately. So that was one of the things I picked up from the trip. And again, you know, I was uh, yeah, I was, I was pushing the um these files, Tom, today with. Uh, uh, the dynamic range, and I think these are all shot in a 5D Mark II. And um, there's a lot of these shots that I, I can't pull them off in, in one exposure, really, or they're yeah. really struggling. Yeah, so it was interesting to get that sense of progression. And and these guys, too, were quite savvy. So, this is actually one of the first times I reckon that I was uh, shooting HDR consistently for that reason. And because I'm a lazy bugger, I only literally started editing some of them uh, yesterday <laughs> from 10 <laughs> years ago. It was like Learning HDRs isn't my idea of a good time. So, so we can uh, expect some Caragini releases quite soon. Oh, uh, maybe, you know, I, I'm, I'm a much better shooter than I am now, but I, I literally these are storytelling images, but at the same time, um, it's it was a great story and it was a really, 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 really inspiring adventure uh, with some pretty exceptional men. And, you know, it's it's kind of nice to be out in country that, you know, not many people have walked before, at least not many, too many, not as many white fellas anyway. Um you know, and I think that's port. I mean, Martin caught me out last week by um, just remember, remembering to acknowledge the fact that there's so much of this land has been walked, walked well before we arrived. But it's one thing you had to be a little bit conscious of is, is we actually had a lot of weather around and these cantons can actually flash flood and they have in the past. So people have been caught out and people have even died. Yeah. So, um, 
So we, wherever we camp, we actually literally, and I'll show you a little bit later, one of the campsites, we would actually scout out somewhere where if we could or we had to, we could scurry out and get mm-hmm. up the top. And there are areas where you can't. Uh, they're literally so steep on both sides, you'd, you'd have no chance or it'd be super dangerous anyway. Um, so that's sort of on our mind in terms of where we orchestrated where our campsites were because we were just off track walking on our own. We didn't quite know where we were going to camp until we got there. So we'd often send someone to scout ahead or, you know, pour over what maps we had or have a look around in the terrain or get up higher and look ahead because it's fairly slow going through here. Is that all uh, silt there, Paul? Or what's, what's it's like I'm it's, sort of like white. Sure. It's, it's like it's asbestos fill, to be honest. Uh. God, it sort of might be. I think it might be actually because this whole area is, is famous for mining asbestos, uh, particularly just north of uh, in Winterloo. Uh, but that pool is just incredible. It's just this aqua, turquoise, chalky white. And here is us. We're actually deciding to get up and, and out of this um, into into our next section where we walked across open sort of country land to get to the next section. So, you know, we were scouting, we're like, you know, you're not going to get up anywhere there too easily, but we saw a bit of a gap. We might be able to climb through this section here. And so we're just heading up there to have a bit of a scout and see if we can get a look and, and get out. And we found a bit of a spot, fairly steep, and the rock sort of falls away pretty quickly. So um, you got to sort of, you don't want to take a fall out there. And then we did sort of a compass bearing across the big open country on the top, which was really stunning in terms of its color palette. Um, back into the Spinifex and the, um, you kind of need a compass bearing to figure out where you're going because not a lot of landmarks when you're out in the open at the top. I mean, you can use the sun to some extent, um, but if you want to end up at the entrance of a gorge and not just in the middle of a random open patch of, of desert, um, you know, you literally kind of get your bearing, you line up a tree or something in the distance along the bearing because you can't always walk in a straight line. You've often got to walk around things. It's beautiful spinifex um, grass curve there. You literally then walk yourself to that next feature that you lined up and then repeat the same process. I mean, you might have to go left or right or around different areas to, to keep it going. Um, it wasn't too bad going through here because it opened out quite a bit. Um, definitely, like, the more spin effects than you can throw a stick at, that was, uh, if you don't know what spin effects is, it's basically spear-bladed grass, which can literally just pierce your skin like nothing. I don't know, how would you describe spin effects, Tom? It's bloody prickly stuff. It's like bloody needles. It yeah, it's really is horrible. Right. If you haven't got gaiters on, it can just pierce you like there's no tomorrow. You don't have to touch it, you know, uh, heavily at all. It, it can literally get in you pretty quick. Yeah, and those snappy gums oh, on the horizon. That's so yeah. amazing, yeah. It's yeah, amazing. you get underneath those and you get a blue sky above them and they're just amazing. It's a bit like the ghost gums you get yeah, in... in- Yes, in the West Max, yep. Yeah. And we, we hadn't talked so much about the geology, but it's actually quite a big feature of the park. It's over 2 billion years old, the exposed rock. It's some of the, um, I think it's even more like 2.4, 2.5. It's some of the oldest accessible rock on the planet um, in terms of its its age. And so there's a certain sort of ancientness to the landscape that doesn't really relate to many places in the world, actually. And here we are sort of, you know, we had different sort of filtration systems and different ideas of, how we're going to manage water. We even carried straws in case we literally couldn't find anything because we weren't really sure what you're going to come across. And then, you know, five or six days, you don't have water. That's that's a pretty major issue when it's 35 degrees and you're walking every day mm. with, with a heavy yeah. sort of pack. So here's an example of um, we found an area where, look, we could probably get out at a, at a snack behind this tree up the top. So we made our campsite down the bottom, um, but we sort of keep an eye out for the weather. And we literally had to delay this part of the trip a week because funny enough, Tom, we had a lot of rain. And um, and it was enough that the even the rangers were like, no, nah, we don't want you on the gorges. Yep. Um, and so we had to wait out. We had a three weeks up our sleeves, so so we had a bit of a window. It was lucky because we probably wouldn't have been able to do this trip otherwise. This is walking out the bottom, and what happened here is we had these big open gorges, and all of a sudden we hit this one, and it was just wall to wall cutting grass and water. And you can see because there's a water source through there and it wasn't through here, this is open and this isn't. Mm. And we had on the sketchy little black and white sort of hand-drawn map saying the most interesting part is all it said. And it was this gorge here, which is going to be the highlight of our trip. And we just couldn't get through it. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> oh, that's all cutting grass, like fierce, oh. sharp edge cutting grass. And, and we gave it like three or four hours. And we were just like, you know, we've got like a 150 meters or something and we got shredded to pieces and, and we went left and went right and we went up high and we tried to figure out a way through it. In the end, we were just like, yeah, not worth it, boys. And so we literally did. We climbed out. 
Right. Maybe um there'd been a fire um back in the day or something that had cleared it out and yeah that's recovered them. It was a bit easier to get through back then on your old yeah your maybe old... would have been a few years though um, yeah that's a termite man for you they're pretty, pretty solid out there and uh, I don't know if they're sort of magnetically aligned or anything but they were um a beautiful feature like I said like it really surprised me how stunning it was on the open sort of areas you know there's always focus on the gorges uh, but going out in open country. Um, has its own own charm, really. Um, far more than I was expecting. You can see in those days, I actually was using a polarizer, uh, which I haven't. Uh, done. Yes, the, that which great motion from one side to the next on a wire. Yeah, wider. good luck controlling the gradation from one side to the other. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then we literally sort of walked out. Um, I think it's a last shot actually of that that part. We looked walked right out to um, the same areas we would have walked out from the edge of that um, of that gorge. So. Absolutely stunning trip. I think David done another nine day trip in a totally different area of the park um, that goes in and out of some of the ravines as well. So it's it's sort of if you've got the skills and imagination and and um, and wherewithal, there's a lot more that you can do uh, in the park. And I'll just finish up with a very very quick drive through Whitnam. So Whitnam is a gorge area on the northern side of the park. And what's really interesting about it, if I can find the photo, is uh, this is a sign you get when you're coming up to it. <laughs> and how asbestos dust may cause cancer so basically it's an abandoned um, blue asbestos mine in there and uh it's been they've tried to sort of force all the residents out and there's five people still living there when we were there so you can see before the coffee shop drop in and then it's uh from old mel mac uh keep out it's my bloody home so they've been trying to push these guys out for years and they and they were literally trying to do it i think so they could then reopen the mine uh, which I think they think of doing um, actually literally now, Tom. Um, okay. And so, so I wouldn't just, I wouldn't recommend publicly for anyone to go in there. Um, and I'm not sure if you can even get in there now. But um, it had rained for a week straight, and most of the danger is from the dry asbestos filaments that are floating around in the air. Mm. So we kind of figured one, we were allowed in there at the time, and two, um, it had been rained so heavily that most of those filaments won't be in the air anymore. And obviously, it had been. Um, closed for quite a few years already so we actually decided to just go in there and to be honest it was one of my favorite areas of the park tom oh. um, getting in there and just um just for its variety and its features and you know again that moody weather sort of really adds an element to it that you don't get too often in that park so you're right mm. about that tom all this sort of blue sky city out there mm. uh, but these beautiful sort of ridges and, and gorges like this is the thing you can imagine like oh let's just go up the hill and it's like well you might end up doing like four <laughs> cliff climbs just to get even remotely close it's it's not actually super easy country to get around um when you get there and um you use whatever you can to get perspective um, i often found myself doing that around sunrise and sunset especially um we had walkie talkies and different things to sort of um keep us in touch with each other so we literally just spent the day driving in there and we did go right into the tailing stamp of the actual mining site, um, which is probably, I wouldn't recommend doing that. For, 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 but uh, because it had been so wet, we decided to do it. We, we literally only went there for five minutes um, and we didn't even know it was there. We just sort of saw it out of the corner of our eye. Uh, there's no guide maps or anything to the town, but a lot of beautiful features, a lot of um, old sheds and abandoned equipment and a really incredibly phot photogenic place to just even drive through. Um, let alone walk. Um, so we were happy to do a bit of driving after our six days walking. Um, the old uh, the old blisters were still there, but um, yeah, it certainly had its own charm. And that, that's actually literally the edge of the, the tail of the tailings tailings dam itself. Uh, you'll see a few more in a second. Um, yeah, there it is. There, so so it has its own kind of photographic kind of charm. It almost looks like one of those sort of semi-volcanic. Um, sort of, you know, lava and sort of type features. Literally that sort of magenta blue colour, Paul, right? Yeah, yeah, like that. You can actually, if you look close, it's actually, or well, the filaments are actually quite blue. Um, when you look in closely, I was like, oh, what are those blue bits? And and uh, cause I don't know what they were. And Glenn's like, yeah, that's the asbestos. And I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah, I'll pull that one back down, mate. Oh. But um, yeah, beautiful features to photograph. So mm. I was just like, even though I'm not meant to be in here, I was just like, shit, this is, this is kind of interesting. Excuse my French. Hope YouTube doesn't cut that off. But um, yeah, well, well worth, uh, well worth the, the dodgy trip went in there. And uh, you know, a decade later, I'm still alive. It, that kind of thing is meant to take a lot of time before it affects you. Um, but uh, there's certainly a lot of cases that have been around long enough where they have shown, you know, direct links between asbestos and cancer. So it's it's not something to tread lightly. So uh, I haven't actually shown these to anyone before or even told anyone a bit in there, but um, 
I figured it's been long enough now that I might not get uh, prosecuted by anybody. <laughs> so, but you might get visa for the mate. It takes forty years. So there you go, forty years. Oh, I'll probably talk about it anyway. So, so yeah. So, what do you call it's it? Calculate, shot, calcul- calculated risk. Yeah. Again, you know, nice to be slowing down a little bit and getting some sort of reach shots and getting down low. But beautiful flowers. Yeah, mm. stunning country. And I don't know. There is a wildfire sort of season out there, Tom, isn't there? Um, I, I'm not that familiar with with uh, the flora to know, but um, there was some spectacular wildflowers out there this year. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely renowned as a feature of the park. Well, I couldn't oh. tell you exactly sort of when and where, but um, I think it all is so dependent on the rain that um, mm. at the end of the day, maybe it's it's uh, just it happens when there's big rain events, or maybe it's a certain time of year. But um, yeah, we had those those beautiful pink flowers alongside the road this year, also. Yeah, a little bit of both, I reckon. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, light, 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 just when it, when it comes to you. And um, and again, like you got, Tom, like getting the cloud features is, is such an unusual, um, It's it's got its own blessing. You know I mean? Like you would have had to, you know, would have had a hell of a headache, headache pulling that trip together and, and reinventing it. But um, at the same time, you'll have photographs that, that very few people will ever probably see or get again. So that's so, it. Uh, Hats off to you, Tom, for pulling that off, mate. I'm, I'm, because I, I know the lay of the land. I, I know what a headache that was, and the limitations you have with provide, you know, the providers and the combination as well. So, well uh, done to you. I was just pleased that it all, it all came off for everybody and everyone got the shots. But it was, you know, literally the first week we didn't open the gorges, and we'd been there since Monday. The gorges didn't open until Saturday, and we were supposed to go home Saturday. And then the following week we had more rain, so those guys had to wait until I think the Thursday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So the first three days of the workshops, we're doing the other gorges and even some of those are closed versus being able to get into Hancock and Wino where we didn't have um, access until sort of like literally the second last day. So it was a bit sketchy, but it, we got away with it in the end and, um, and got those spectacular storm scapes as well, which um, are just incredible. And, and if anybody wants to see the sort of finished photos, because not all those were finished, um, you jump on my website, tomputt.com go into locations, Karajini, and you'll see sort of the best 30 or 40 or 50 shots that I've taken there over the years. It's yeah, probably I'll, worth I'll mentioning too. That today, there's, there's a beautiful set, Tom. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, it was magnificent. And it's worth mentioning too that you don't take, you take workshops to more places than Karajini as well. So, <laughs> yes. you know, that's um, all booked up for next year, but I'm sure you've got plenty of other things on the go. So, Well, I'd like um, to be doing more this year as well, but... Um, yeah, me I, don't too. I don't want to be. I don't want to be the doomsday. But if they're talking about us needing to be 70, 80 percent vaccinated, we're still two or three months away from that. So if we're in this lockdown for another two, three months, there goes um, there goes Lake Air again for another year. It's been two years since I've been there, and I'm desperate to get back there. And then Shark Bay, where we had a whole series of aerial workshops booked up there too. So it's um it's not the greatest time in the world to be involved in the travel industry or the photography workshop industry, if, unless you live in somewhere like beautiful Tasmania. Where yes. you've, uh, we're very jealous that you can get out and do stuff. And that sort of preamble to this uh, whole presentation tonight, I was just going, la, 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 la. Certainly not taking it for granted, that's for sure. We know how, um, how quickly no, the not, can mate. change. It, it yeah. might be our turn next week, mate. Who knows? So, um, yeah, you know, just... Um, it's I, a good I, thing, though. Our healthcare system wouldn't probably be able to handle it very well. So, um, yeah, so it could end no. badly. Well, you know, um, just a side note, I just wanted to acknowledge um, you guys for putting these on each week and um, providing... I'm sure it's a great benefit to people who haven't got that opportunity to escape and take their own photographs. So I, I hope that people get to escape for an hour or two and uh, forget about uh, what's going on in the outside world. Uh, and so thank you very much guys for doing that. I know you do this out of your um, your passion and interest for landscape photography. You don't get financially rewarded for it. Um, and so I really want to, you know, just thank you on behalf of everybody for uh, your, your hard work. Oh, very uh, welcome. Stop. If we get yeah, to chat on, to mate. folks cool. like you, mate, it's all well worthwhile. You can chat to me anytime, Luke. I'm oh, only, that's I'm only a phone man. call away, mate, just uh, my number. <laughs> Tom, I'm trying to think about the 10th anniversary uh, putting hole and workshop, mate. I'm in, um, I'm thinking about it. Yes, absolutely. Well, mate, you know, you know, we, I love catching up with uh, all you guys, and uh, and that's what I'm craving the most. Is it's it's not work for me because at the end of the day, I I love just sharing my passion of landscape photography. I love teaching it and and getting out and about and taking photographs with you guys, whether it's a personal trip or whether it's work. It's um 
it's just what it's all about reconnecting with nature and i think that's what so many people are are missing at the moment is just that ability to um to be able to just get out and and have that connection with the, the beautiful world that we live in so hopefully it's um it's it's the end in sight so to speak mm. Well, yeah, I certainly got my um, eyesight um, eyes fixed on Karajini in April next year. So I'm very, very much hoping that I can get over there. So this has been a huge inspiration for me. So I really appreciate that. Tom, anything you wanted to finish on or, or show us before we win? No, no, no. I've done enough talking and enough showing. <laughs> I think I showed everything I, I pretty much wanted to and um, or had in mind. And uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it and got a feel for what it's like. And uh, And if you don't, if you don't come with me, make sure you get you get there uh, at the very least, just to have a poke around and and see how beautiful it really is. Because it's a, it's a it's a nice adventure to get there. It's not only great photography; it's an adventure to get down into those gorges and have a bit of a play. And um, just make sure you do it. Yeah, I, I started the show and I wrote it. I, I think it is one of the great iconic landscape areas of Australia, to be honest. Well, and, well, and think about it, yeah. I, I think it's I think it's one of the most unique landscapes in the world. I, I don't know too many other places that look the way that Karajini does when you get inside those gorges. I mean, you've got slot canyons in the US and other places throughout the world, but show me a place that looks like Karajini in the rest of the world. I, I don't think there's too many. It's it's so unique. It really is. Yeah, and as I wrote on the YouTube um, blurb, um, I don't, I really can't recall a place that I've heard photographers rave about so much after having visited. It's really um, like, it. it's just, you never hear a bad word about it at all so um and, and it is one of those places that I'm, I'm you know paul and i've done a lot of camera club judging a lot of uh you know aipp judging etc and it was one of those places before i went that every time i'd see a photo i'd just roll my eyes and go oh here we go Karajini again you know not hard to see where this photo is from and we've seen this before and all the rest of it and i have such a deeper appreciation for those photos and and the place itself after being there because you, it's really one of those places um like all the room, you know, like you've seen a million and one photographs of it, but until you go and experience yourself and you have that deep connection with the land and its energy and its spirituality, et cetera, mm. you really can't appreciate it until you actually get there. So. Yeah, we're really hoping to have an Uluru show soon, actually. So um, oh, you haven't come on yet. Yeah. That'll, oh, be, that that'll be two hours of Luke and then two hours of Paul and then maybe... No, I haven't been, Tom. Haven't been. Yeah, we'll get definitely my friend called. Jay Evans no. on um, That's that one. Unbelievable. Yeah, wow, I've yeah. got to leave a few sort of jewels here and there, you know. So I want to take them all off. Oh, you've you've got it. Nothing, nothing will prepare you for the first time you see that rock. I mean, mm. you feel like you've been there already because you've seen so many photos of it, right? But especially, you know, as young kids growing up, you'd be in every single textbook that you'd, you'd get at school or on the cover or whatever else. But um, there's just something about it. I'm not very religious or spiritual etc but there's a deep energy in that place that oh, i i think it's just i think it's a spiritual we'll side of thing, australia yeah. there's no two ways about it it's yeah. it's it's um it's something that just draws you back each time and I, i'm incredibly moved every time i go there and i, mm. I can't explain why but um uh, ella my daughter is desperate to get there as well and 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 um you know she's quite an intuitive um person as well and i think she'll find it deeply moving also i can't wait to i'd love it. to sit with the storms that you've captured there at carriageny but at all the reason be <laughs> well you know like uh you know louise denton was there yeah. um earlier this year yeah, she, yeah got she got it she got it pretty wet and stormy stuff um there's been other photographers as well as there is a season out there to to get that those photos it's sort of like i've been in there in november and had a few storms um but yeah, you really have to be lucky to get those waterfalls coming off because that doesn't happen often. Mm, anyway, we digress. Much like, it's like it's much like Karajini. It's sort of like you know, it rains and then and then the waterfalls come down, and half an hour later they can it can disappear. Literally. Yeah, that's yeah. Ephemeral. Well, I hope that gallery is filled with um, people with big pockets shortly, mate. It's been tough to be honest. Um, you know, like uh, we're living off the smell of an oily rag at the moment um, because we don't sell anything without being open. Really, uh, despite the thousands of hours I've poured into my uh, website and continue to do so, hoping that one day um, it will pay off. But um, yeah, we, we'll we'll just uh, hope that uh, it all kicks off again soon and we can make some sales here and we can get some workshops happening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Good luck, mate. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Have a lockdown. We're thinking of you. We're not trying to gloat. Mm. 
or, or do anything? No, 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 no. We're, we're coming up to signing our lease again, believe it or not. It's been three years, even though we've only been open sort of two. So it kind of feels a bit weird that we're having to sign a lease again because it feels like only yesterday that we opened. But yeah. no, we're in it for the long haul. I, I say to Mary and others, I say, you know, I haven't spent... And that's not been my sole focus, but the 20, last 25 years photographing landscapes in order to not, you know, have other people want to appreciate them as well, hopefully. Mm-hmm. And so I'd love to have this open for the next 20 years, but um, it's not easy during these times. And it's not easy starting any business, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Otherwise everyone would do it. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. No, Just well done, mate. Proud, um, proud of you, certainly- brother. Yeah, it thanks, looks man. absolutely thanks support, stunning everybody. as you can see behind. And thank so. you guys again for having me on tonight. Um, always a pleasure to catch up with you guys and I really appreciate um, the opportunity to uh, speak about uh, the places that I love so much too. Yeah, and I'm sure yeah. it won't be the last time. So um... uh, you're, our, you're our number one star, mate. No one, <laughs> I'm your no, number no one, one go-to. To. <laughs> yeah. you're the, you're the 11, I'm the 11th hour. <laughs> yeah. Most, can't most get anyone consistent, else on. reliable, uh, across the board, every genre, every place everything you do it all tom and that's that's why we love having you back mate and you're yeah, having you know, oh, it's, it's always lovely I all right well with that complete. um we'll um we'll better leave it there we've um i think we've broken records all over the place i'm sure that our audience has probably been <laughs> oh, the ones we've ever had too so um so <laughs> Nick's been dying to go to the toilet for the past three hours <laughs> <laughs> all right well um <laughs> Catch you guys later. See you next week. And we'll be back with another great show. We won't have Tom, unfortunately, but um, who knows? Thank maybe God. last 11th hour we'll get him back on something else. So, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, see you later, everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks we'll so much, Tom. And um, we'll see you again next week. Please like and subscribe. Um, it's great to have you subscribing and, and um, liking our videos just so we can reach a wider audience um, as well. So yeah, um, have a great, good one guys. and catch you later. Bye.